Hi there. So you're about to watch a conversation that I had with a somebody I respect a lot and whom I consider a good friend, J.F. Martel. J.F. is an extremely uh, well-read and insightful guy. He's very familiar with the Christian tradition. And, well, I mean, he's a practicing Christian, but uh, he's also very familiar with how that connects to philosophy and these other worlds of spirituality. And I love talking to him about this kind of stuff, which we're, we're going to get into. We have a long conversation on kind of the nature of evil. Um, but JF is actually teaching a course on a platform called Neuralearning. I've uh, taken one of his classes before, and it was a really awesome experience. And so I just want to link that down below. If you want to be part of that, it's going to be starting pretty soon. Um, and I'm going to be there, too. So I'll say hi if you if you join in. Anyway, here's the conversation we had. I think you're really going to enjoy it. have my little notes over here. I'm not, I'm, we're, not, we're not doing a notes to conversation, but I, I have notes of some things I was thinking about this week, so I just want to have them handy. That's There's great. Some, some no, quotes wonderful. and things. I will try to be very precise because <laughs> you, you ask you ask really hard questions. And I don't you drill know. To, yeah. I, I, I don't mind if it gets really, really out there or, I mean, I, I don't, I don't, I, I don't want you to worry so much about being, I mean, respond however you want, but I mean, yeah, Let's let's let let the conversation go wherever it wants to go because I I, I really am not exactly sure how this I, I have like a rough I have a rough frame that I'd like to try to fill in with with an interesting painting but I don't know what the painting is going to look like yet so it's great <laughs> but I, I thought the most important thing for talking about something like this is is to just get the framing right and. That's I mean that's what I was trying to think about I, I was kind of panicking I was like how do I how do I even build a big enough border to kind of cover this especially in the sort of practical way that i want to want to think about it and want to talk about it because yeah i mean what are you saying Sorry. i think the a frame is very important i think to have right up until the moment where you start and then you kind of forget the frame <laughs> and follow you know we can do this as a walk in a walk in the woods as uh i was told recently peter gabriel uses that expression a lot a walk, a walk in, the, in woods. the woods for how to write a song or how to create something. Mm -hmm. It's just like, instead of trying to uh, contain the process and some kind of conceptual, you just kind of start walking and you find things and it might seem a little clumsy and haphazard, but then eventually you find some shape to it. That's, um, that's what Phil and I do on weird studies. We never, ever plan. We never talk before we record, and so we we make discoveries. And sometimes sometimes it's, it really works. Sometimes it doesn't work as well. Um, but it's always I think it's always worth the effort. Yeah, it's, you know, Phil think... Phil's favorite expression is a solvatur uh, solvatur ambulando, which means it is solved by walking. Solved by walking. Okay, Am yeah. ambulando. Is it, sorry, did I say that right? Ambul ambulando. Ambulando. Okay, and that's the same like yeah. circumambulation, like walking around something. Ambulate is to walk in okay. Latin. Now I'm, now I'm learning some more Latin. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> I just noticed too, whenever I've tried to... Latin for walking, I think. That's one of them. Whenever I try to like memorize an explanation for something or like how I want to communicate it to like... Because obviously I told you before, I teach teach music and yeah. stuff like that. But I've, you know, when I was... Even before that, I was... Oftentimes I was traveling with my parents and they had like a traveling kind of Christian music ministry thing. And I used oh, to cool. go and I would teach the kids and I would teach them like Bible lessons. But anytime I try to like, I'm trying to like communicate something and I think too much about it beforehand and like try to memorize something, I always kind of shoot myself in the foot in the process because then I'm like, how did I say it before? That was really good. How, and yeah. I, I can't, get, can't get into that place. So it's, I, I'm going to do a lot better here if I can just, if we can just let things go. If we can just walk. Yeah, yeah so, exactly. Let's just go for a walk. So let's go for a walk, but let's let I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna try and choose the woods we want to walk in here because sure. <laughs> so far, deciduous forest or evergreen. So far let's go for the evergreen. Okay, the, the perennial. <laughs> stuff. Good. Okay, yeah, that's actually a good way of phrasing it too. But I was thinking, so I mean, I, with this kind of project so far, a lot of the reason I even wanted to start it was because of kind of frustration with 
with my own culture, with with my own co- sort of more personal culture of evangelicalism, but then even more broadly, just with the culture of the West in general, mm. kind of frustrated with our our current our, our current cultural moment and like seeing you know kind of crazy amounts of division and seeing myself kind of following falling into it it's like it's it it feels only natural to like as the world expands and as we have access to more to just in order to psychologically deal with that kind of demonize more and more of it and i've even in my attempts to like i mean the the whole i mean even the logo is a kind of a uh, take on the yin yang it's like these kind of opposites coming together of like this white substance and then this kind of nebulous dark substance and i wanted to like okay i think that's kind of what conversation is it's like sitting down with somebody who who sees something different than you and and you're kind of coming from opposite perspectives and you want to kind of have some sort of synthesis there Mm. and i i I intuitively i mean it it doesn't take much i mean a, a kid i think can intuit that it's it's i think it's one of the most sort of fundamental intuitions is that opposites can kind of come together and for some reason that's good it, it does something interesting it does something good yeah yeah dialectics dialogos yeah exactly yeah, and absolutely but i mean i'm i'm struggling to even so i was saying even in doing that even in trying to do more conversations i've gradually been actually building up these sort of giants of things that I that I even more demonize like I I, I getting been getting more and more frustrated with like capitalism and with the internet and with you know like reductionist theology and and all these things and Mm -hmm. I don't I feel like I'm becoming like a bit of a Marxist, like in in the bad way, not the good way. (laughs) And I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid of myself becoming too too sort of critical of, of things I, and I, I've had my I've even had my friends kind of call me out on this of just like why why are you so negative why are you so like angry about everything all the time and I, I don't I don't like that in myself and I don't like that perspective but I'm I thought about it even in terms of like you know sort of as a for a tribe to kind of consist you know in, in back in tribal times back when people were living in tribes I guess there's still people that are living in tribes in, in untouched parts of the world but in order to to exist, you need to have some sort of unifying story that helps you to kind of make sense of your place in the world and what your people are doing. Right. And you need to, and and, and sort of what's against you and what's sort of the enemy. But the the myth... An out group. Exactly, yeah. So so you have to have... It's kind of, yeah. You have to have a myth that like, that makes sense of of your identity and your group and the place you're at. But your myth only really has to be as big as your group. Right. And and this is the thing that I, 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 this is kind of the, I think the center of the problem is just that I notice that because of the technology that we have now, we're sort of expected to, to deal with, like our, our, our group is, is the entire universe now. Yeah. We've, we've gone, we've gone planetary. So the problem is that we're still working with uh, um, clunky equipment that's not necessarily yet adapted to a planetary culture, which is what we have. And I think that the the pro- like the planetary has like great promise, but also great danger. There's great danger in unifying everything under a single myth. I mean, part of the part of the the one one big affordance of of myth is that it was always m- multiple and pluralistic it was always engaged in dialogue with other myths right each myth is in dialogue with other myths and culture is the emergence of new syntheses from the clash of myths um so it's hard to imagine how we could have a kind of monolithic mythology which would have resolved all of the conflicts and unified them unified everyone under some kind of you know some kind of monomyth it's hard to imagine that happening without it being uh it, profoundly and like seriously tyrannical in some way because we lose the multiplicity which has been the great richness of human culture and you know we talk about diversity today well diversity applies that you know it's, it should scale right as we you know as we discussed recently it should scale all the way up into the divine itself right um 
uh, if you, and, and, and so how do we, and, and I think that the challenge today is that we, we still need our myths. We still need these kind of narratives that make sense of things. Uh, but the narratives always, they always, they tend to create in groups and out groups, right? They tend to create tr tribes or, or collectives. And then of course the outside appears suddenly in a light that's a little bit uh, in a strange light to us. And so how do we, how do we do that without falling into the ruts of the real serious like division and, and conflict and strife? And I, I'm wondering if even like that's, it might just be a problem with the way that we're we're understanding what in group and out group means, or or the dynamics of how those work. Because I, I, it seems like, because it, yeah, it's like you have you have the in group and then you have sort of the adversary. But that's that is how sort of um, what do you call it? Um, oh, I just I just brain farted. But. It, 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 you have opposite forces working together and you get more precise. It's like a neuro, uh, neuropsychological um, sort of right. strategy. Uh, opponent processing, that's what I'm trying to think. Opponent, opponent processing, processing, okay, yeah. Liter literally is like it's opposite forces coming together, which allows for like uh, more precise or, or, or more intentional behavior or, or, or maybe, maybe deeper. Yeah, and that's an attitudinal thing. And I think that that's actually the key is what we have to learn is kind of a is is to, to learn to live with difference right to learn to live with people who who don't agree with us and i think that there's always been a tendency to um to uh to basically to want to and you know out of our natural pride to want to affirm our stance and 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 use the other as a kind of um as an uh, instead of a, of seeing him or her or whatever or they as an adversary or a rival let's say seeing them as a kind of enemy that needs to be eliminated and um because then we can feel that we have the whole story you know northrop fry had a a wonderful he's a canadian literary critic um he was uh, a contemporary of marshall McLuhan, and the two were knew each other we're big fans of each other, but Northrop Fry, um, uh, in his book *The Great Code*, with his, which is his literary analysis of the of the Bible, which is sitting in my nightstand right now, and I've only cracked the intro. <laughs> uh, it's a great, it's a great book. I'm glad that you're checking that out. I, not many people read it these days, at least in, in the circles I run in. It's really, really great. Um, and so is the kind of sequel, the other book you wrote, in the called *Words with Power*. Very, very good. Okay. Um, basically defines myth as uh, he defines ideology as a, a partial myth or a myth that's been pulled down into mm. the worldly realm um, such that it becomes fully understandable and digestible from a particular vantage point. So in other words, you take a myth, myths are innately ambiguous, paradoxical, strange, uh, uh, open to multiple interpretations, uh, applicable in new situations, um, in strange ways. And yet when you take a myth and you just, um, immanentize it, you know, translate it into the, to, into this world, this, this world of, of knowable conceptual objects, then you've basically turned the myth into an ideology. And I think that with one of the, the downsides of the whole kind of digital revolution is that it has uh, encouraged us to to push in that direction, to further immanentize and uh, our, our myths, and to, to to basically become even more entrenched in ideology than we were before in more subtle ways. Like I wouldn't want to say that the early twenty early early twentieth century wasn't steeped in ideology. Obviously, it was seriously. But now it seems that um, the the battle which was taking place on the kind of like Western world, like not the world stage, but the civilizational stage in the 20th century is now happening inside each of us. Like the political divisions of the outside are now inhabiting us. I remember having the insight, I don't know if it was a true insight but recently in a conversation with Phil Ford, where I realized it just occurred to me that when someone is engaging in like 
really kind of hateful vituperations on the internet against their you know favorite political enemy in a sense what they're arguing with i mean these are people sitting alone at their computers talking to no one uh they're talking to someone who maybe has a false name on some forum it seems to me that their first and foremost enemy is themselves like the the hyper conservative who's always online proving to everyone how conservative he is is in sen- is in a sense fighting the liberal in him and these interior battles which were interior before have now been um externalized into these forums and we play each other's shadows we play each other's surfaces for projections and this is to the great profit of a whole industry that's r- risen around this they're monetizing our interiority and they're exter- by externalizing it and i think that that's so when you said you know you, you don't like the way you're demonizing a lot i think that the only thing that deserves demonization are demons <laughs> you know right not only do demons should demons be demonized but you know so my point being that when we look at certain technologies certain developments i guess it's as long as we understand that we're speaking in a, a theological or, a, or a philosophical language or uh, we have to decide like we have to find where the demons are right. um and and i think that there are forces in this world that um are adequate adequately described by that word yeah and and um and i think that a lot of what's going on in the tech sector i think is seriously problematic for us like there's very little i mean maybe it'll all turn into this beautiful love story in the end maybe it'll all turn out for the best but it's a huge wager it's a huge gamble on our part yeah. to invest in some of these things and and that's what i'm so totally back and forth on is that it's like on it's very easy for me to slip into just having absolutely zero faith in silicon valley and zero faith in in Western industrialization as a whole. I just I, I I can I can easily fall into this apocalyptic narrative of okay, there's just there's sort of too much, too much pride, too much ignorant lack of foresight here that almost all these projects are are so incredibly powerful that they're, the destruction they're going to to re is just is too much. Like it's not not something we're going to be able to recover from. Yeah. And yeah, well, yeah, I, I know what you're saying. Yeah, like yeah. The, the the psychological damage of 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 how much you know how much the internet is is destroying people. I mean, I, I and I don't know if I'm just being too much of a. It's not even a conspiracy theory because because the, the the conspiracy I, I I'm I'm still thinking is is I'm, I'm thinking about it in, in your terms. I'm thinking about it in terms of sort of demonic patterns of that are more abstract and aren't. I'm not looking at a specific guy out there that's trying to like fuck everybody's brain up and and George ruin the world. Sort of yeah, yeah. But I but I understand why those intuitions are growing increasingly popular. I have so many friends that are like really into going down those rabbit holes and trying to find okay who's the one responsible for it? because it seems so obvious that somebody is trying to turn us all against each other. I, yeah. I, I think actually it might be fun fun because I I'm, I think you have a pretty interesting way of, of talking about this in an interesting perspective. You said the only thing we should be demonizing is demons. And I, I, I want to even maybe push back on that a little bit. But first, I want to see if you can I, I want to hear your take on what a, what a, how you should think about what a demon is. Right. Well, um, huh. Uh, I've been pretty open on weird studies and elsewhere about my conviction that um, there are intelligences engaging with humanity that are uh, discorporeal and real. So uh, when I talk about demons, I mean demons. (laughs) (laughs) It's, Um, I mean, that whole category though, like entities that are not, I mean, I think I just I we need we need to Oh right okay we're, 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 let me use a less charged term daimons that's okay. the greek term that we got demon <laughs> from daimons is nice and neutral and that's what i mean um uh a daimon is a spirit um uh an intelligence an entity uh, and these things are constantly uh working beneath behind through and in our institutions our patterns of thought um if it makes you more comfortable you can think of all this as metaphor and it's just as good 
you know, um, and that's what, that's what someone like Carl Jung was actually quite ambiguous about what he thought really existed. Hmm. Uh, in fact, he was less and less ambiguous as he, as he progressed in his work. And certainly we know from, from reading now the red book and some of the, the more secret, uh, writings that he had a quite, uh, literal understanding of some of these things that he believed that there was actually something going on in, in the, in the, on the other side, so to speak. Uh, but you can choose to look at it metaphorically and it'll work just as well. Um, patterns of thought, what we mean to say when we talk about ideology or patterns of thought are pre-thought thoughts. They're thoughts that are being thought for you, right? Um, so we can follow, uh, and this can be good or bad. That's why, you know, in addition to daimons include not just demons, but also angels, right? Angels understood as the, um, uh, the intellectual energies at work in the world, right? So, you know, if you, you create, uh, uh, there's a term in occult, in occult science or in, in the occult tradition, egregore is a term that's used for, but let's say we form a group, the, you know, the two of us, uh, and we recruit others and we form a kind of little church or a little cult. And we give it a name, we give it symbol symbolism, we give it ritual, liturgy. Well, as we do that, we create an egregore, especially if our cult is centered around uh, some kind of personified intelligence, then we create a vessel in which psychic energies can can flow and 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 the the, the we will have created a, a kind of living thinking entity. And whereas we may have set out having with the plan of creating a God in the end, we become ruled by this God because it it's, it's, it's more expansive being uncontained by a body. It can, it can, it can kind of just like follow courses of intellectual thought much further than we can. It can, yeah, yeah. It can, it can see things coming. It, it becomes a pattern. I thought about it before as even, because I mean, I, I I'm trying to, 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 knock at different ways into getting into conversation about spirits and spiritual beings again because it's difficult for me to in engage that part of my brain it's difficult for me to, to to try to like it's like i feel like i should believe that it feels convincing on some level but it's it's really hard to engage in thinking yeah. about it for me for some reason and i i, I want to even separately i want to just talk about that sometime but sure um i i I think about, or one of the ways that's helped me to kind of engage it a little bit more is even just think about like maybe in terms of like stories, where it's like you you set up you set up a certain situation, you set up certain characters, and you start to bring a story to life, and then it's like you set up you set up the board in such a way that like it implies a certain existence, it implies a certain trajectory, and like there there, there still may be like you. That's the thing. There's still variability within that, so it's. It, I, I guess maybe that's part of what makes it really feel like a living thing, but like th there is a sense in which if you you start writing it and then you make the wrong move as a writer, it's like that's not where the story's going. It's like that. So so then it really feels like you're grappling with a with a with a with a pattern that's real and it's beyond your you know arbitrary design. Yeah, I mean artists know this very well. I mean, the the work starts to dictate what it needs eventually. And um, it starts to kind of get a life of its own. And, you know, writers have often reported that their characters suddenly start acting on their own. <laughs> uh, and, and, and then it's a matter of like following the character instead of like writing out some preconceived outline or plot. Uh, songwriters, certainly they're finding the shape of a song or finding the shape yeah. of a sculpture. It's kind of there's this there's there's this implicit order in the process that it's the artist's job to find and then o obey, you know, in a weird yeah. way uh, and respect. And it, that doesn't mean that the artist is completely possessed uh, by the work of art, but it means that there is a very, a, a negotiation between yeah. equals is a better way of defining the artistic process than a kind yeah. of like imposition of one's intention onto matter such that the object produced is a perfect representation of the artist's inner state. I mean, we all know that artists and their work are always at odds, right? Um, there's always a difference. Um, you might set out to write a novel that proves that Marxism is the correct, you know, um, way of assessing or appraising reality. And then of course, 
in 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 that effort you might come up with all kinds of if you're doing a good good work of art if it's not just a piece of propaganda at the end the... it will subvert your point of view right, it right. will have subverted marxism at least yeah. shown the limitations of any particular point of view so artists are always being betrayed by their work of art works of art if they did them properly and they ended up being great works of art you know because right. of course it's anybody can make a piece of propaganda for whatever viewpoint they want so that's just one example of these uh discorporeal or um disincarnate intelligences that if you abstract that if you subtract that from your understanding of reality you yeah. really won't understand reality at all you won't understand like i don't know what religions are what 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 a company is a company with a logo you know like companies have their own kind of ontological right being that's not just reducible to the, all the multiplicity of people working in it there's something beyond that there's, what, there's like like apple is more yeah, than just yeah there's a, there's a, there's a spirit of apple yeah there's a spirit right. and that's um yeah jonathan pajot talks about this yeah. really brilliantly he, he talks about like team spirit as well like because th these are these are terms that for some reason haven't haven't totally lost their meaning to us in the west even even though we've mostly kind of thrown a lot of religious terminology out or at least overtly we didn't realize i, I don't know for, for some reason this this terminology still lands to some extent, mm -hmm. although I, I, I can see some circles where even this is just like, ah, oh, that's just kind of, that's almost superstitious to talk about something like Team Spear. Like it's just, I, I, I have some friends that are you know, descending so deeply into pragmatism that it's like, even something like that is difficult to grasp. Well, well, I think a lot of people will say, no, I get it. A lot of people will say something like, yeah, I get what you mean by Team Spirit or by like Apple is more than the sum of its employees. I get that. But they might say, but that's just epiphenomenal. That's just so because everybody's the, but um, the, the leap that, that I make and that you might not be ready to make is that, no, 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 it, you, you, Apple, whatever is inhabiting Apple existed before Apple. Apple was just the vessel for its uh, semi-incarnation or its manifestation. So I, I really do believe in the reality of, of other realms of existence and other forms of intelligence that precede us. They're not just in our heads. They're not just fancy ways for us to talk about what humans do. They're actually part of reality. And I guess my reasons for, for believing that are are you know we could get into that yeah yeah let's, let's get into that another time but but i i think we can i think i think that that at least gives me a little bit more of a of a, of a way into the, the thinking about in, in terms of, of demons in, in, especially in terms of this conversation so we're talking so you said you the only thing that we we should demonize is demons and so so let's say that, that there's sort of a demonic sort of spirit of of capitalism or a spirit of of the internet even i i actually i, I know another guy in kind of the the general circle of, of people that I'm following on on YouTube who are doing these kinds of talks is I think he's tried to coin the name of that god and call it the churn, which I think is awesome. I like that. <laughs> it sounds really big and creepy, kind of Lovecraftian, but it's yeah, it's like this big just more content, just giving you more. It's like this very gray and disgusting. It's like massive. <laughs> right. It's it's an interesting image. I like it. Um, another possible candidate would be, yeah. Do you know Rudolf Steiner? He was a, he was a, he founded a, I guess, a field of a philosophical or tr spiritual tradition called Anthroposophy, okay. which was, um, he broke off, he broke away from Theosophy, which was very popular in the late 19th century and started Anthroposophy. And Rudolf Steiner is kind of this brilliant occultist. He would have, he was a mystic, but also he wrote about like everything. He wrote about like agriculture. He wrote about education. Uh, he wrote about like every possible endeavor you could think of and uh, really started a kind of, you know, viable tradition that continues to this day. And um, part of his mystical system was that there are two kind of demonic for lack of a better term spirits uh in the in in, in the, the cosmos and in the soul in the human soul and he called them ariman and lucifer and ariman of course was the evil the principle of evil in the old persian religions right okay. so zoroastrianism i think or am i getting mixed up with manichaean anyways and the old dualistic okay. persian religions the prince, the evil principle, the dark principle, which was equal to the principle of light in that cosmology is called Araman. And so Steiner 
brings him on, online. And the other one is Lucifer. So what Araman does is it tries, he tries to push us to the, to, into the lower spaces. He's heavy into matter, industry. You know, like if you think about Saruman, in uh, in Lord of the Rings, whose name sounds like Araman, mm -hmm. Saruman builds. It's all about like digging in the earth and turning rock into right. mach war machines. Yeah, and, and the orcs are very sort of materialistic. Like even yes, everything is, they, they're literally made out of of earth, and that's where they're born. They just come out exactly. out of. But then also oh, like God. they they don't value life beyond it just being sort of food. Like everything is basically just as low as little meaning as could possibly as it could possibly express that's sort of their their view of it precisely precisely exactly so it's aramanic saruman knows that this is a limited view but he is he's he's weaponizing that way of seeing things he's using that as a as a means of and then the other demonic entity in steiner's system is lucifer and lucifer is light lucifer is about rise ascent mm, yeah, so it's about ascending far. to ever more ethereal and and uh and uh um uh, what's the word i'm looking for kind of towards a kind of pure diaphany of non-being towards the up into the astral always up through pride right like uh um and so uh i think that there's something about the kind of whole transhumanist internet Thing, which is a, it's very right. much you, you I, I introduce... feel a lot of Gnostic inclinations yeah. in that scene like there's a lot of um, um, like talking about the body as wetware and um, and and or uh, what does it call it the meat some expression like the meat you is basically like you know meatware or whatever and the, our point our goal is to translate ourselves into this pure diaphanous information that's where order lies that's where things run smoothly and we have to become less and less incarnate more and more we have to lift ourselves out of this gross material form and ascend to this kind of pure inf informatics of being you know that's and um that's a luciferian so i guess steiner i think steiner would probably look at the whole digital phenomenon and say that this is a luciferian or at least the danger in it is a Luciferian danger. Um, he would look at what and say it's Luciferian danger? The whole digital culture thing. The whole like kind of uh, transhumanist um, internet. Uh, Interesting. Yeah, well, it, it's 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 funny technology. because it, it, it's, it's that, but it's at the same time. Yeah, that's interesting because at the same time, our technology is... On, on one end, sure, sure, it's kind of bringing everything together into this, I guess, yeah, there are a lot of people who have the kind of the idea of like, okay, let's let's transcend our human state and, and even eventually upload our brains to computers so we can get rid of all this imperfection of, of organ organisms and, and, and cells and stuff like that. William that James said deplete. it's about eliminating the intolerable intervals. Intolerable so intervals. Aiming for a purely digital existence is you get rid of the intolerable intervals of analog Existence. Right, which you don't have to wait. Everything is it's on and off switches, ones and zeros. You move from one state to the next instantly. You don't have to go through the trouble of walking to the post office. You just click on the post office button. Exactly. Yeah. Like everything is. You're removing the intervals of life. Um, that's the kind of aspiration of that side. But you're saying there's another side too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. Sorry, I I, I was going to even. I just wanted to find this quote for a second because this is. This is nice. I, li I like this. Um, Lewis talked about the same kind of thing. He said, which one? Let me see if I can find it. Here we go. He says, the truth is of course that what one regards as interruptions are precisely one's life. <laughs> yeah, right. So it's we we want to want to get rid of all those interruptions as if that's not the substance of life in itself. I mean, even that is sort of responsive to. I mean, that's not even a, a full a full statement about life, but it's 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 great meeting this moment of 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 trying to kind of remove all the space in between, and that's what kind of the whole process of like okay. 
I'm scrolling through content so I can get to the next like the next big explosion of of excitement and of of dopamine and of like of whatever goodness is whatever we think that is which I, our definition is probably pretty silly at this point but you're trying to get right. to the next one of those yeah okay so I, I see trying to move the yeah, but the other other side of the space is that technology is about sort of the um it's funny because it, it, it for some reason that aesthetically connects to this that kind of materialism thing as well where it's like it's everything is about the the minimum viable product or it's about like it, it's stripping everything of having having mysterious meaning to have kind of a, a very clear and obvious meaning of okay this is good because it's um it, right it, it right it, it solves my hunger or it solves my sex drive or it solves this right it's just like it's directly about kind of these base desires which to me kind of relates back to that that orc thing of okay i'm just looking for living things because that's food and that's all that living things are that's what all these thousands of cows are that we're throwing in the grinder every day that's what all these all, all, our entire meat industry is just like okay that's just food those aren't beings right yeah I think that Steiner would agree. I think that in a sense, the Luciferian ascent and the Aramanic descent are always together. So you can't have one without the other. That's what makes it kind of demonic. It's this distancing, this separation inside right. us. The, 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 intellect, the intellectual part of us is moving up, and, but it's still always you know, like a balloon with a, like the, you know, with a weight underneath it. It's always also pulling up all of the base parts of us that also have to be. So what we do is this, this, we have this abstract transmutation of base drives into just purely biological needs, like, like uh, uh, body hacking is kind of a Luciferian way of doing something very aromatic. So you've got your, your love doll, for your sex surges, right? <laughs> Keep her in the closet. Yeah. You know those dolls that yeah. <laughs> you'll have like your 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 favorite. You know, uh, I don't know. And then you have all those. Every particular drive will will plug into some app or some mm -hmm. device, which which like massages it and and placates it. Mm -hmm. And so you're you end up being just plugged on to various machines that are keeping your 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 drive satisfied right. so like that then you can continue your ascent it's like it's it's this really bizarre thing so you're right there's also this whole aromatic dimension this churn also i think the churn idea is really good because it's showing the social effects the socio-political effect of this internet which is or or, or also the the it's the the babble like effect of the mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that everyone can speak to everybody we all speak the same language, ones and zeros, binary language, but no one can understand each other anymore, which is the the, the, the tragedy of Babel. When humans try to create something that contains all, right. then they can't communicate anymore. Or even my wife and I just started trying to read um, 1984 together, and, and we got halfway through the first chapter, and then it, and then it sends you to the appendix if you want to, where he, he or was written a short essay about this new speak language, mm -hmm. which is designed... Uh, to do its best to make discussing anything impossible basically yeah the language is is extremely simple and and almost every variance in words especially aesthetic variance in words is is minimized as much as possible so that way you can only say very logical things or technical things there's no room for the aesthetic there's no room for opinion or, or no no room for even even accidentally saying something that's unorthodox like words he said even like words like freedom are stripped of their meaning where it's freedom is, is still a, a word that you could use but it would mean like okay that dog is free of lice or yeah it, right. it just me it, it doesn't have anything to do with intellectual or, or or spiritual or political freedom it's like you can't even express meaning because words become so uniform and so boring that you, you even try to talk to somebody and, th and there's no room for ideas and I, I, that's interesting because yeah. it's like this is that's yeah. like the truly tyrannical state it's just like a, a minimization of language where everything becomes short or even I, it just jargon takes over because i was i was thinking about it a little bit but i was like I, i'm not sure if words would actually end up getting shorter because I, I i think in some sense we see that in our culture but we also see them getting sort of longer and i like i like chesterton's um little riff on that about how you know the world is like full of these big words that are rattling on, on like like train cars or whatever where it's he says they it's mean nothing right it's like you haven't bothered to encounter the idea of what this what, what's behind the word you're you're just kind of you're you're spitting out a word that you know people are is kind of get to get you some claps get you some some 
some likes. But he, he says, you know, it, it's not the big words that are hard. It's the small words that are hard because you have to really engage with the ideas. Exactly. Yeah, it's a beautiful little passage in, in orthodoxy there about that. Um, the uh, I think Orwell's warning was that the 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 powers that be, let's say, have figured out the language is the key to 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 control. And so he warned us that there would be a progressive, gradual, and he didn't just aim this at the Eastern Bloc at the time. It was like civilizational. He thought that the danger was just as present in in the West as it as it was obviously in Soviet Russia at the time. He warned us that language would be used in this way. Um, and that's exactly what happened. I think we're in a situation now where new speak and double speak are basically just something everyone has to deal with constantly. And it has been that way for a while, but there's, it's particularly, it's increasingly egregious. I find now think what you will. I'm not um, saying that I disagree with the, well, I have my criticisms for the way that COVID has been handled. Okay. Um, I'm not a denier that, that the virus is real or that vaccines work. I'm not going there. Please don't think I am. <laughs> um, geez. Uh, but uh, just just occurred to me the other day, I was watching the, the press conference, the Ontario press conference for the new measures now that Omicron, the evil transformer has come. Um, the, so Omicron is, is, has arrived. And so there's these new measures are in place now. And they didn't want to use the word lockdown because they knew that people are sick and tired of lockdown. So they right. use this new word, circuit breaker. And you saw the politicians use the word, the experts, it's not the politicians, but the, the medical experts, okay. we need an immediate circuit breaker. And all of a sudden, immediately in the room, in the question period, all the journalists start, oh, uh, could you please, uh, so you're talking about a circuit breaker. What kind of circuit breaker do you think? They immediately adopt the term and then they repeat it to us. And now we're not talking about lockdowns anymore. We're talking about circuit breakers. Um, and it's funny because, okay, circuit breaker sounds neutral. It doesn't sound like anyone's being locked anywhere. Um, but of course, it implies that humans are just uh, circuitry and we need to like break the circuit here and there so that they stop circulating so that the, you know, I can understand what the right. logic is, but you can see how it's total new speak or double speak in the sense. So not necessarily new speak. You, you constantly invent new words to mean old things in order to make them seem different from what went on before. So uh, with each phase of a project, you can cha change the terminology and people will think they're just in a new situation where in fact they're being pushed in a very specific direction through these. So um, we can immediately move away from COVID. I just wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, but that, that's, stick that, to the, yeah. that, that's interesting though. But I, I want to see how, how that might plug in here because but, but one of the things that I, I you mean you laid out that Rudolf Steiner ha, has these two two gods of, of Lucifer and uh, Aruman Aruman I can remember that Saruman Aruman um, which is interesting to me because uh, when I look at all these different philosophers who have sort of tried to solve the problem of opposites or even even modern modern psychologists like uh like Jung or Freud it's like the, the their point is that you actually need the opposites to come together but in a certain sense you see them like they're coming together but in a really sort of ugly way in this in this Steinerian story right where it's yeah. you really have both of those opposites present and I, I think you really see that in our in our current moment, in our modern world, too, it's like we we definitely have the opposites. They're there, and they're violently, violently wrestling in a really, really tenuous and unstable way. Where it's like I don't know if if we're gonna make it through this. It's like the there's too much opposites, or like I, so. I'm I'm I think I have some intuition as to how how to do it right, but I'm I'm wondering how. Well, I want to see if we can we can kind of talk through it a little bit. Like, what's the difference between just having the opposites? I mean. Yeah, just having the opposites versus having them, you know, come together and make something beautiful and yeah, and participate right, in, right. because oh, great and and that's I, th I think yeah. So I, I we both just read this. You just you just taught me a whole bunch about it. You lectured on it for like six lectures, <laughs> but the in the first chapter, I think I think he says something about it too. He says you know there's a difference between just saying paradoxes for the sake of kind of 
uh, messing with people's brains and getting them to think that you sound interesting versus wrestling with the truth and tell the only way of, of thinking and talking about it is paradox. Right. Right. I think it was Niels Bohr, or one of the great physicists, maybe it was um, David Bohm, said the opposite of a great truth isn't a great falsehood, but another great truth. And ultimately, mm. um, it seems to me that a, a lot of the ancient philosophy I've noticed was always wrestling with paradox, not in the spirit of resolving paradox. There were some paradoxes that needed to be resolved because they're basically fundamental logical paradoxes. We can't live with logical paradoxes, but we can live with existential paradoxes. We can live with metaphysical paradoxes. For instance, one of the examples in, in Chesterton's book is the coexistence of free will and destiny. There's a kind of contradiction there, right? If I have a destiny, then all my free choices are leading to me to my destiny, then they weren't free. There is a way of thinking about free will and destiny uh, uh, so that they can both exist and both be affirmed without that implying a logical paradox. But it requires the affirmation of mystery as the kind of fundamental core of reality. And this is what theology does. And, uh, most forms of philosophy, especially like modern philosophy, don't want to, to make. So whereas in philosophy, a paradox is intolerable in most cases, you don't want a paradox in your philosophical system. You want to resolve it. You want to resolve paradoxes. That's how you proceed through a phys philosophical inquiry, by resolving paradoxes, resolving conflicts or points of tension or whatever. Um, theology um, in the West has always been about, and in the East as well, uh, in its own way, it wasn't called theology, but it's always about how do we, now that, since we know that these two things are true and they can't be reconciled rationally, how do we think about the world such that these two truths can coexist comfortably? And I think that's one of the things that religion does is it allows you to live with paradox so that you can, so that you're not so that you can get on with your day, so that you can say in one moment, that was my destiny. This feels like destiny. And in another moment, what will I do today? You know, how will I react to this situation? And be able to do both without any, without the, those two moments put side by side, implying some kind of paradox. Um, and, uh, and so living with paradox is, is important. And at one part in the course, I tried to make the argument that whereas paradox is intolerable in a kind of uh, strict instrumental kind of philosophy, a philosophy that's really geared at like looking at arguments, you don't want paradoxes in there. In myth, which is the, the kind of bread and butter of religion, um, uh, paradox is perfectly comfortable. Paradox has its place in fairy tales and myths. Things can be can, can break all kinds of rational laws, uh, um, and and still and and get their meaning from that. That's kind of that's kind of part of what makes them meaningful. That's what makes them applicable. Uh, in a way, it's kind of the difference between you know Tolkien in his uh, introduction to a later edition of Lord of the Rings um, was fighting against or pushing against the tendency among his his fans, his readers, to uh, turn Lord of the Rings into an allegory, an allegory of the bomb, an allegory of Nazism, an allegory yeah, of this, yeah. that, and the other thing. And he said, I'm not denying that the story does apply uncannily well to, for example, the story of the H-bomb, not the H-bomb, the A-bomb, the atomic yeah, bomb. Yeah. But he says, we have to understand there's a different, it wasn't written that way. And I think we lose something if we apply it just to that, if right. we reduce it to that. If we say Lord of the Rings equals, you know, the Manhattan Project or something like that, or the Second World War. Yeah. He says there's a difference between allegory and applicability. An allegory is a, 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 an aesthetic construct that really does reduce to what it means, such that once you've understood the allegory, you could arguably just get rid of, it, of the work of art that deliver the allegory and just settle for the argument it was making, right. the, what, what it was exposing. But in, in something like the Lord of the Rings, 
it's applicable without being allegorical because it's it's existing at the level of myth. Therefore, it's very much applicable to all kinds of situations, not just situations of you, like of you judging society or talking about history, like, oh, that's, the, but also internalizing and looking at how, you know, the story of Frodo and Gandalf and, and Aragorn, how does that reflect for you? It applies in your personal, right. first and foremost, it's like applicable, it's, it's a scalable applicability that goes all the way up and all the way down. That's what myth does. And that's what philosophy could never do unless it turns into myth. And that's what you see in Plato. That's why Plato is such a fantastic philosopher. It's that the minute there's a point in Plato's dialogues where he goes, okay, we've made the argument and we've either hit a part, we've either hit a paradox or my conclusion is sounds, but may sound banal. So what he does when those, ha- when those things happen is he suddenly launches into myth. And all of a sudden Plato turns into like the craziest poetic uh, invention, uh, some of the best poetry ever written. And it's like in the same text as the dialogue. Why does he need this? And a lot of people have just tried to reduce the myths to the argument that preceded, right, right. preceded it. Or, But in fact, it's, it's a lot richer than that. Is, he was well aware that at some point it has to resolve in myth. It has to resolve in some kind of more religious apprehension. Is, is, Plato, is Plato basically the, one of the first guys to really marry philosophy and myth in that way because i know no like, earlier you've got like empedocles you got heraclitus you got different guys trying to talk about the um the problem of opposites and, and they're i mean em- empedocles I, I only just read some wikipedia articles and watched some videos on this guy i just found him interesting oh he's fat he's fascinating he's, he's like yeah because he's super weird because he's like even thinks of himself as like this uh, angelic king or kind of wizard a figure god. or something like that he's yeah, he's a he's a god and but he's a doctor and he's a philosopher and he's he's all these things all at once he but- was a he was a sorcerer he was a, <laughs> that's not that's actually what he was like he was a sorcerer wow. he would like work magic and make me you know, um he would do miracle work and he would he was a priest and a, a wizard and that's what philosophers were um you know um but he had like the it is uh, what's that Oh no! I was just, we can go to Heraclitus too, but I was going to say with Empedocles, he has this like I, I intuitively made the same picture as he did when I started when I started listening to Jordan Peterson talking about archetypes and all these different things and trying to think about evil and trying to think about trying to resolving this whole picture of the world. And I was like, okay, it's it's like the seasons, right? And 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 he that's that's the way Empedocles uh, his his kind of picture of this cosmic cycle is that it goes between. Um, harmony and chaos or like violence and love yeah yeah, yeah exactly yeah yeah exactly which and now we're in the strife part we're in the entrop- entropy part of the story you mean because we're in winter well according to to empedocles we had begun the oh on the, uh, in the very in the strife cosmic part. turning of the of the of the world yeah well i mean his idea was very similar to the modern idea of like big bang and then the uh what do you call it when the universe contracts and uh, there's a term for that right it returns to the point of singularity and then the big bang would repeat itself kind of right as right, right right of the universe expands what a crazy thing to intuit that many years ago <laughs> oh it's it's actually nuts um there's a great podcast called the secret history of western esotericism uh the host is earl fontanelle this guy is brilliant and his, uh, his episode on Empedocles is really worth listening to. And at the end, he makes this really interesting parallel between Empedocles', Empedocles cosmic vision and modern scientific theory. It's really staggering. Man, I want to listen to that. So check it out. Um, I'll make sure I throw that in the links. It was very poetic, obviously. Um, he wrote in poetry. So, does Par- so did Parmenides. Um, and, and Plato is kind of the outlier in the sense that he's the one who's changing things by bringing in Socratic dialectics into it. Um, so in a sense, it wasn't Plato's innovation to, to bring poetry and it was already in philosophy. Um, what, what I like about Plato is that he is, uh, he's, he's bridging something. I think he's, he's bringing in what we would call modern rationality into that arena. Uh, and I guess to be fair, you could say that he's wrecking it. In a way, in a way, and some people have said that he kind of wrecked philosophy; that it okay. was mystical and and and. But I. Th- but that's that's great that he does it in in the f- yeah. frame of a conversation too. I mean, that's a good touch point for me, anyway. It's just that it's like it's the only possible to really wrestle with these things in terms of of dialogue. 
what I love about Plato is that myth in his world, since he uses the dialogue form, so he's he's a thinker of multiplicity, right? Uh, he's a thinker in terms, he thinks in terms of multiplicities. He needs many characters to make a point. He needs many contending viewpoints. And it's in that context, this, this, this multiplicity of viewpoints, that's where myth arises and then falls. It's like in Solaris, I know I was telling you about that, yeah. uh, Solaris is a, a novel by Stanislav Lem, great film by Tarkovsky about a sentient planet. And uh, the explorers who go to this planet, the, the planet's covered in this ocean and the ocean thinks and feels and it, it can create things. It can like, pres- it, it, it brings people back from the dead, people that the scientists have known, brings them back and gives them a body so they can, and nobody knows what this planet wants or what it's doing or if it's conscious, it's really strange. But one of the things the planet does is it, it builds these constructs out of its ocean. So the ocean will suddenly coalesce into these, these crystals and it'll build like cities and things wow. from people's past or like gi- gigantic swimming babies and all of this really <laughs> weird stuff. Yeah, really weird stuff. And, and, yet, and then the things eventually just collapse back into the ocean. And the, the scientists don't know why it does this. Like, why is it doing this? But the, the, the myth is like that in Plato. It rises out of the dialogues and then falls back into the into the sea of of multiplicity. And that makes him very different from Parmenides or Empedocles, who really have a kind of more priestly. Uh, I have the truth. I am the god kind of thing going on. Uh, and I'm not saying that critically i think there's a place for that and i think they were part of very rich traditions spiritual traditions but there's something special about plato plato in a sense creates in a sense he kind of creates modernity long before anything we might call modern in a historical sense um and uh and yet he retains myth as a central part and i guess that's what my point is is that he retains the fundamental role that myth must play in order to make sense of the whole, we can't just settle for rational discourse. We have, we need to reach into the mystery and to reach into more mystagogic or uh, uh, religious depths in order to make sense of things. So the, the, the earlier guys who, who sort of posed this question, did they have, I mean, they're, I mean, even so we've brought up three names, Heraclitus, Empedocles, and Socrates, Plato. Um, yeah they all seem interested in this problem and see it as a real problem. But and so Socrates is, is solution is sort of just, well, I mean, you can't, it's almost like to try to just say what his solution is, is, is to defeat exactly what you just said, which is that you don't just say a logical statement and there there's the argument. It's that you have to sort of experience the myth. You have to experience the conversation. Yeah. There's a whole school of thought now. Um, and I think it's very compelling uh, that Plato's dialogues are just part on the almost scriptural dimension of a retro richer tradition, which we've largely lost, that Plato was actually engaged in a kind of ascesis, uh, a, a, a religious tradition, a practice, um, and that philosophy was one part of it, much like philosophical discourse is one part of yoga in India. It has all these other limbs, right? I think the, there's eight limbs of yoga, or there might have been something like that in Athens and Plato what we the texts that he left behind are just one aspect mm. of uh, a religious practice, a mystic a mystical practice aimed at kind of union with the one or something like that. There's also a very interesting aspect of Plato, which is his unwritten doctrines, right? Um, so Plato uh, in Aristotle, Aristotle makes reference to Plato's unwritten doctrines, and Aristotle actually talks about like because he was taught by Plato. So he often has little asides about, yeah, Plato used to say this, but uh, it's kind of weird to read Aristotle talk about Plato. <laughs> it's like really strange. But um, he says, uh, he makes reference to this unwritten doctrine. And we have in another text, I can't remember who it is, it's in some other ancient text actually describes this talk that Plato gave in Athens about the one and the good, the good. I think it was called the good, the talk. And in that, he kind of lays out a very kind of... Um, almost Gnostic uh, vision of the cosmos as the one and then um, the the dyad, which is this other aspect of the one which separates things. And this whole kind of more mystical religious uh, tradition that Plato would have been a proponent of, that we've kind of lost that. Which I have another friend who even wants to to, to glue that together with the Christian doctrine of the Trinity, of that there's like a, there's a oneness and then there's the dyad and they come together and you have this Oh, triune triangle, that's, right? That's what it is. <laughs> it is. I, I think of it that way too. 
Plato invented Christianity. <laughs> Seriously, like yeah. he, he, it's so close. It's, I mean, you can look at it if you're, if you're. See, this, this stuff, this is why I want to hear you talk to John Verveke sometime, is because I think you guys both resonate on this point a lot. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I, yeah. He, he set the stage, you know, and, and, and Christianity is, you know, Nietzsche said Christianity is Plato for the masses. And I think that's completely right. The only thing that Nietzsche has nothing but contempt for the masses, but I have, I'm a democratic person. So I have a lot of respect for the masses. So like Plato is Christianity is Plato for, for people as opposed to specialist mm. aristocrats. Yeah. So it, it somehow is, is a myth that, so I, I, I my into, I mean, partially it's, there's a bias because I was, I was raised, I'm, I'm a Western, I'm a, I'm a white guy. I, I was raised in a, in, a, in a Christian family. So like Christianity, there's, there's, bias that's in the bottom of my soul that's like oh somehow my religion has to be it's got to be the answer somehow right and even even if you know even if i want to step back and be a little bit more inclusive to other religions it's like i still need to regardless of whether or not it's the only way of, of coming about an answer to this problem it is it, it has to be my answer likely i need to figure out how to square my own my own religious story with this problem if i if i want to engage with it right well that's that yeah, you know I don't think it's particularly controversial to say that that Christianity is platonic. Um, if I spin it this way, if I say Plato was like John the Baptist preparing us for the incarnation, which is what some yeah. Christians might say, and that might be what I believe on some level, um, that would be a little too con contentious, I think. All I'm saying is that Christianity really, really draws deep on the Neoplatonic well. When it when it formulates its doctrines, it really draws on Plato, and so um, and also I think that there was a problem in in Greek civilization, a pro a serious problem about what a what a human being is, what we should do, the ethical problem that um, Christianity came as an answer to. There were lots of answers being offered up in late antiquity. It was kind of a time of crisis, a lot like our times, and so all these answers were coming up, and Christianity kind of like one it became the answer that worked um and and because it was resolving a lot of tensions that it, that had come up in the neoplatonic tradition and stoicism and all the other uh spiritual traditions of the of the of late antiquity there was something wasn't resolved and um christianity came to resolve it how else would you explain the success of a religion it obviously result it obviously answers some questions if it's yeah. spread like it did so you could also make an argument, I guess, if you're Muslim, that that Islam is actually the completion and, and plenitude and fulfillment of Plato. Um, some of the, it seems to me that some of the Islamic philosophers of the past might have argued that, um, but I don't know of any Jews who would claim that Judaism is the is the full the the, the fulfillment of Plato because obviously Judaism draws on a, a different tradition, um, like. Uh, and 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 Christianity, I guess, kind of tries to bring the Mosaic tradition, right, right, and in conjunction with the Platonic tradition. Um, and in fact, that's another thing. Just out of just in case you're interested in any of this, in late antiquity in Alexandria, Moses was as big as Plato. Like people were talking about Plato, people were talk, also talking about Moses. Not just Jews, a lot of Hellenized Jews, but a lot also a lot of just Greek thinkers. Moses had shown up, showed up, and he was, in a sense, more ancient than Plato, or it came from a totally different uh, place. But they were trying to show how Mo Moses was part of Plato, Plato's lineage, um, preceding Plato, so that Plato had learned what he what he learned from Moses. But so, um, I, I think the bigger question, though, is that why? I, I, this is back to the question that we were already, I think, trying to to, to dig into, and and I think we we have a partial answer, or at least you you're, you give me something here, anyways. Is that okay? So myth, story, art somehow brings together paradoxical argument or or, or paradoxical statements in a way that that um, that just pure logical going back at it against each other can't do sometimes, right? But. So I want to do I want to I want to see how that relates to Christianity, but I want to I want to do something for a second because I was I just had kind of a, a thought this week as I was teaching a student the difference between major and minor chords, and I want to I actually can pretty easily load this up. It's going to mess up the screen for a second, but I want to do this. I'm going to set up my piano. Here we go. Let's get a piano, and then we'll make a new track. Um. Close 
is this? I think. Okay, you hearing that? Yep. Okay. Unfortunately, I'm not. I need to see if I can make it so I can hear it too. <laughs> no problem. There you go. Great. This is this is what I want. So I was trying to teach them the difference between how to recognize a major and minor chord because on, on the piano, it's it's pretty easy to just like learn your basic chords. Like you learn a C chord, it's just it's all white notes, easy to see, and and you can't quite see from this camera angle, but it's pretty easy to find it too because it's just note, skip a note, and then skip another note. Right. Then you, then you get into some other chords, and you think that pattern is going to keep working. Like if you try and play a B chord. You just play all the white notes, and it doesn't doesn't sound like a major chord anymore. Right. You realize you have to start actually counting the intervals, and so I, I, I explain. Okay, in order to make a major chord, you have to count it, and it's going to be one, two, three, four, from the C to the E, and then one, two, three, from the E to the G. That's, and both of those are thirds, but the C to the E is a major third, and the E to the G is a minor third. Right. And the, the intuition is that okay, once you've got a major third, if you want to have a major chord, you just you just do all major major thirds together, right? But if you right. do that, you get... Oh! You get an augmented chord, which is not a nice sounding chord at all. Right. And it's the same case with... Okay, so if you want to have a minor chord, you think so a minor third is one, two, three. Right? Just establish... We get this nice... Kind of, kind of sad, kind of foreboding. If you do an another minor third on top of that... Yeah. Another extremely ugly chord. But right. if, you, if you want a, a more palatable and, and more sort of may, maybe even more beautiful uh, minor chord, it's it's a minor third on the bottom and a major third on the top. Oh yeah. So I always talk about it as if like so it's the bottom the bottom third that kind of, that kind of establishes the foundation of the chord, but there still needs to be this sort of give and take between major and minor, regardless, right. in order for it to be to have this beautiful harmony that we're that we're, we so like. I mean, and, and I'm not saying that you should never use an augmented chord or a or a diminished chord, those are some really, they can create an amazing amount of tension that once you resolve from them, they can have a really... Anyway, um, yeah. Obviously, there's, there's, it's not like those chords are off limits, but they, they are kind of very sort of uh, monomaniacal in a certain sense that it's just like, okay, right. nothing but major thirds. And you can even keep stacking them and get more and more creepy sounding chords but I go minor third minor third minor third it just gets worse the more I add <laughs> right right I love that but so it, it's it's interesting to me that a really um, a really decent composer can somehow engage even these sort of ugly chords like the the diminished chord or the augmented chord and put them in context, yeah, with extreme amounts of dissonance, where it's like, that just doesn't even sound like a good chord. And then they'll bring it into the context of this beautiful piece of music that suddenly it's like, right. that's even where some of the beauty of the music is derived from, is that in incredible amount of tension. And then the, the release when we get back to a more palatable chord, like a, a traditional major or, or minor chord. Yeah. Right. And so, to me, the analogy seems to be, I, I feel that that connects to what we're talking about as far as these, these giants of... of social media and of sort of capitalist industrialization all these frustrating demons that i that i don't like they have an incredible amount of tension and i, I don't want to strip them of their perhaps actual evil right but I, i'm not sure how to how to how to do that because in some sense i mean when i start thinking about things in terms of in terms of like harmony it's like okay ultimately we just need to learn how to resolve these tensions and not think of them as as something that can never you know that can never participate in the grand story in the grand song, but I don't know. You know, if you if you just evil is obviously a very very <clears throat> strong word that we we all do well to like <coughs> excuse me to save for very special occasions. Evil and hate should be words we use seldomly, um, seldomly. Yeah, but but the. I think you're 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 bringing in an important thing here, and I think your musical analogy actually kind of just drives this home in a way. It's that um, evil theologically, all it means 
in my understanding, evil theologically in the Catholic tradition that I'm familiar with means lack, means lacking complete. It's lacking fullness. It's negation. It's, it's, it's a turning away from something full. In a way, it's like the refusal to see to live with paradox in a certain sense is the beginning of evil. Mm. So when we say that, I think that instead of saying these currents, these forces are evil or demonic, which to secular ears will sound like you're a Bible thumping preacher in the South or something like that. Well, it sounds d- dismissive too. It sounds dismissive. It sounds, uh, yeah, it's, it just sounds uh, hyperbolic. I don't know. It's, it just sounds uh, off to people. Um, what, uh, what I mean when I use these words, and sometimes I do use these words, I think they're warranted, um, considering the, the amount of damage, especially when you talk about social media's effects on kids. I have two daughters whom, instead of deciding to keep them completely off of social media, they are off of social media, uh, actually, my older daughter now has a TikTok account. She doesn't post, but she can follow a few things. Anyways, I decided to... It's a slippery slope, man. Yeah, <laughs> it's a very, very slippery slope. But I thought that it would be worse if I just withheld it than mm-hmm. if I allowed her some access to it that's monitored and, and accompanied. And I think one of the big things about parenting isn't about what you what you prevent your kids from doing, but what you do with them when they're not doing the things that they want to mm-hmm. like it's very important for me to take my daughters to church. Okay. It's very important for me to take my daughters to the art gallery, to play board games with them, to, to read books to them. You know, that to me does a lot of good, I think. So I said, since I'm, we're putting this effort into doing these things, we can afford to give them some access to these technologies, but it's not a, a decision that I think was right every day. Sometimes I'm afraid that I made the wrong decision because the damage that's being done by these, by these, these, uh, these technologies to our children is in, is incalculable. Like it'll take generations to assess what we're doing, to, to realize what we're doing to them. Um, so all this to say that to me is qualifies as something that is evil, especially when you hear all the leaks now about Facebook and how fully aware they were of what they were doing and continue to do it. Um, you know, knowingly driving kids to suicide to me is not a, is an evil thing to do, <laughs> you know, yeah. so there is that moral loop, but I think that the evil doesn't come from, it's so ironic that Google's motto for a while was don't, don't be evil. <laughs> don't be evil. And then they removed it. <laughs> yeah, I, <know. laughs> I think we're, I mean, uh, these other, these other rules are fine, but I think that, uh, I think kind of. That's a little bit too harsh. I think sometimes we want to be a little. <laughs> <laughs> so, but if you see evil as lack, as as refusal to see the fullness which is given to you to see, right? Right, because it's easier to close your eyes to this one aspect of things so that you can permit yourself to do this. This is something we all do. That's what the, in theology evil means. It's not this horrible. It's it's a technical term, you know. Like, and but I agree. I, I I I at the same time, I think we have to be very careful about using it. Um, I don't think that the people working at Facebook are evil necessarily, but I do think that the the company as a whole is misguided in that it's not seeing it's 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 holding a certain set of values above all others to the detriment of other values. And mm-hmm. so, communication for Mark Zuckerberg is the most important thing in the world. Nothing else matters. He believes that if you could bring people together and directly to one another, all the problems will be solved, would be solved. And what does he do? Is he inserts himself between everybody on earth. He inserts his system into the personal relations that pre-existed him. So f- Facebook is a way of m- commodifying friendship. That's mm-hmm. what it was about, commodifying family relationships. It was about mediating what had not been mediated before. And so in the name of communication, he has actually created the biggest barrier to communication anyone has ever managed to erect. Wow. Yeah. Because of a limited view of things. And what I appreciate in our religious traditions and religious traditions, East and West, but I as a Westerner, my religious tradition is Western. And that's what I try to um, 
to honor and to live up to in light of also of what I love and respect in other traditions. So I, I am a pluralistic person. I don't believe the West has it right and other people have it wrong. But what I get from that tradition is a sense that we need a careful balancing of values. You can't just take one thing, like, for example, health or communication or freedom yeah. or justice and make it the only thing that matters because then you'll destroy everything else and you'll turn it that thing into its opposite. Mm -hmm. All the values have to balance each other in a careful, uh, in a careful dance. And I think that the last 2000, last 3000 years have been a progressive attempt, a, a, a continuing, a continuous attempt on the part of people around the, pl the planet to create systems that allow for that careful balance to exist. You see it in indigenous cultures, the way they had achieved that. You see it in Asian cultures, the way they had achieved that in Africa, they had achieved it in different places. And then of course, what we have is the European monster, which basically just starts to um, just destroy those careful ecosystems of these eco-ethical systems, let's call them, these ethical ecologies that existed everywhere to replace them with something universal. But then, of course, by the point that the West had begun to do that, it had already uprooted and destroyed its own system for doing that. So it was already too late. So I think that, that that's, what, that's what I mean by evil. It's like, or that's what I would try to mean when I use the word evil is that it's a limited apprehension of something very, very complex right, and right. something that is only fully understandable in light of some kind of mythological consciousness. It's not something you can just reduce to instrumental reason. So you're, you're describing evil as, as, as at least it's analogy, analogous to, um, to ideology or, or, or but yeah, yeah. In, yeah. A, a closed system, a closed model of, of the universe and of goodness of what you're after. And it's like, it's interesting because, yeah, if you want to do a project or you want to do a business, you want to do a big project like Facebook, you have to kind of set out with a bit of a mission statement. But unless you have room in that mission statement for for change and evolution and kind of wondering what it is you're after, then basically you're building a system set out to, to become, to participate in this this churn or, or to, to go out and become this massive giant that just wants to take the world and eat it and digest it into itself and just become more itself. Exactly. And also you, I mean, anyone, even the two of us now where, I mean, we're, this is going to be on YouTube, right? So we're already participating in something that actually has values that we might not fully agree with, or has sets of values that we might, we might have arranged differently. So the thing is that it's like, it's like my criticism, just to go back to the COVID thing. Uh, I'm, you know, as I said, I'm not anti-vaccine. I'm not, uh, but I do believe that, um, while the health experts in the interest of people's health will um, call for pass passport vaccines in order to make the, sorry, the <laughs> will call for vaccine passports in order to make those vaccine passports feasible in order to realize these things, they will need to rely on tech companies who are acting in the background of all this, developing the technologies required for these measures. And those tech companies are, do not share the same values as the health experts and right. politicians who want to bring in the measures. They have another set of values, which is ubiquitous communication, ubiquitous control, ubiquitous surveillance. That's their goal. That's what these tech companies want. Yeah. So the end might be noble, but we're using means that have their own ends. But isn't that not having to do with the pandemic? Especially living in the, in the moment that we. I mean, it's, it's a, it's, this is a perennial situation. I think. It ba is. Basically, no matter when you're living, you're surrounded by by forces that sort of have their own their own goals in mind, and, and many of them might be very ideological. But I, what my hope is, and, and what my intuition is, is that a proper myth helps you to figure out how to actually engage with and participate in those voice forces without succ succumbing to them. I, I, in my, I, I like the, the story you shared. I mean, just talking about your daughter, like that makes a lot of sense. It's, it sounds terrifying and dangerous because it's like you're, you're, you're in some sense giving her up to these demonic forces of, 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 of internet and, and of capitalism that they want it, that, I mean, that one of their primary motives is, is connection at the, um, 
it's profitable connection, connection, profitable connection. Yeah, which is usually <laughs> people getting angry at each other, or people getting jealous of each other, or people competing for likes, people entering into this game of commodifying every element of their life and turning it into nothing. But right, this ugly thing. So, but somehow, so, I mean, actually, I you know, do you know who Norm Macdonald is? Probably. Oh yes, of course. Awesome guy. I I only like I mean I I had a few friends send me the odd like video clip of him saying something goofy the past couple of years, but then when he passed away not too long ago, something just grabbed me and I was like I need to just I don't know I, I watched everything I could find on North McDonald. I, I mean every, my my YouTube algorithm just kind of got custom fitted to this where right. I, every day I was just watching two or three different like half an hour to hour long videos of him doing interviews and talking to different people. Because the the deeper the deeper I went with this guy, he just he kept on he kept on being extremely interesting and weird and and because it, like on one end he seems like, I mean he, he, you could think of him as a sort of a comedic genius, but then on the other end it's like his jokes are so stupid sometimes. He's <laughs> he, he, this really really strange combination of like very intuitively, um, yeah, very intuitive, very very sort of smart in that way, but like. And very well read too, but just kind of comes off as an idiot at the same time. Yeah, and it's it's so hard to like pin him down. Like, is this guy a total idiot, or 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 is he one of the smartest people I've ever listened to? But yes, <laughs> and uh, he he at least for his own satisfaction solved the problem of evil. He he's he. I remember just talking to a random person on on a podcast, and like they weren't into it. But I mean, he's just like. He seems like he doesn't care. He just wants to talk about whatever is on his mind. He's like, you know, I was thinking about it the other day, and I thought, you know, why is there evil? And uh, and you and you want to? I figured it out. <laughs> the computer's kind of like, okay, uh, so why is there evil, Norm? And he's because he's he was he had a he he was a self proclaimed Christian, so he would think about things in in terms of spirits and and in terms of God. And he's like, okay, so right, there's. He said the reason that God, that a good God could create evil is because if everything's good, it's kind of, the way he described it is that it's, it's kind of boring. Like you, you don't, if, if everything's good, you don't take any action to create anything at that point. It's like you've established, and now I'm, now I'm going to use words that he wasn't saying because I, I can't even say it as beautifully and simply as he said it, but just like you, you create a world that's... um. It's just static, and it's it's just deeply itself. I mean, you, you essentially, if you create a world that's statically good, you've created what you just kind of explained is an evil world. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But beyond that, it's like he said, like it's so much. It's like I, I think he described it as like God wanted a challenge for himself. Is in like he, it's he created evil so that way it could be something truly amazing when he could create good out of it. Because creating good out of good doesn't mean anything, but creating good out of evil is this beautiful, crazy thing that, like, how did you do that? But well, he, here we're coming to a, a very core issue, I think. But to keep finish your thought first. Sorry, I don't want to interrupt. I, I mean, I think I don't know what example he applied it to, but to me, that kind of rings over into the story you're talking about of like of, of trying to trying to implement, trying to Im integrate forces, even that you kind of see as evil, like looking at, at, at something like the internet where it's like, it's so frustrating how much this wants to mess with our attention and mess with our psychology, but choosing to engage it and say, there's something, even with so much frustratingly evil about this, there's something that's good about it. Yeah. Or, or there's something that can be redeemed. If there's one thing I never want to be, is it's the good son. You know, in the prodigal son, you know, the, the, yeah, yeah. You don't want to be the good son um, because the good son is filled with resentment when his goodness isn't properly rewarded. Right. So you have to engage with evil. You have to like, I, I, I like the way Norm Macdonald put it because essentially that's the way I'd put it as well. Good has to be gratuitous. It has to be a work of grace. It has to be, if, if something is good necessarily, if something, if, if a good just comes mechanically out of a process, then it's just subjectively good for objective good to occur. It has to break in a causally into the world out of pure, sheer, gratuitous, not unnecessary, non-necessity It has to be completely unnecessary. And so in other words, good and therefore evil have to be rooted in a kind of freedom 
a freedom not just of humans to decide what they do, but a freedom of nature to be what it what it what it is. A freedom that of creation that is more fundamental than any causal laws. I don't know if we want to go there too much, but that's kind of my sketch of, of what, why I think good immediately implies evil. I mean, my wife, we were taking a walk the other day and Leslie was like, well, of course there's evil because when, you know, he, we were talking about Genesis and when God says, let there be light, all this light appears over the waters, right? Because, and, and all, automatically all these shadows appear between the waves and the waters. So you've already created shadow with the light. There's just, it's the free act of giving necessarily if if what i do for you is good if i do something good for you if you fall into the river through the ice in the river and i jump in and pull you out and i do this it's only good if i could have just watched you instead it's it's if if right if you happen to let's say you fall in the water and a piece a nice flow like a piece of ice happens to float right by you and you grab onto it well, you're not going to thank the piece. You might thank the piece of ice by personifying it. Oh, thanks for being there, you know, piece of, but you're not like going to bring the piece of ice to city hall and give it a medal um, because it happened to be there. And you could, you, well, that God, sounds like a like, great, like children's story. As soon as you start talking exactly. that way. <laughs> exactly. Uh, you, you do this. The reason you thank the person and you bring them to city hall and give them a medal uh, in the children's book is because the person didn't have to do it. So the, 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 the act of goodness implies the possibility of an act of evil. Um, I need to have the choice. And I would say that what we feel in ourselves, what we experience in ourselves as this radical freedom combined with a strange moral obligation. And I think that's the human condition. A radical freedom combined with this bizarre commandment. It's really strange. That fundamental freedom that we feel in ourselves as human beings is scales down into nature and up. So it's actually that, that sense of existential freedom, that abyss in ourselves is actually not just present in the human soul, but in the heart of nature itself. The creation itself exists on that condition, radical freedom and a strange commandment. It's really weird, but that's, that's what I draw out of my theological understandings anyways so there needs to be evil like uh, you know there needs to be evil if there is to be freedom there so there needs to be the be genuine be. like i mean i i i've tr i you know where i go in this conversation because i always wonder about sort of the, the final evil mm -hmm. because so even another little like little symbolism thing. I know one of so Jonathan Peugeot's brother Matthew Peugeot wrote a book about symbolism called uh, the Language of Creation. Yeah, and in that he talks about the etym the etymology of the word wrong, which is like rung or ring in in some languages. I think. Um, okay. Which is like that. There's the right. There's the there's the kind of the linear course of things. It's like this is the logical way things that are uh, the way things sort of seem to go and the, and the way they maybe ought to be but wrong is this ring of it's like a circular kind of opposites eating themselves and like spinning around and, and and change and it's it's like even even the dichotomy of right and left of that right is is sort of the more I mean, most people are right-handed left left-handedness is sort of the exception to the rule so there's there, there's the right course of action and then there's the the course of action that's like the exception where things you don't seem to go anywhere it's kind of it eats itself and it flips over so yeah. even even right and wrong as as concepts in in a in a more ancient cosmology sometimes it's just like they there there's nothing like there's nothing about being i mean there there's something about that that picture of the circle that's like okay, that's more difficult for me to deal with but it's like a, it, it doesn't seem like it's something that you just cast out and never you know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm plugging it into my own tradition because the way that we evangelical Christians talk about talk about evil is that it's something to be fought against and defeated and pushed away and destroyed. It's like almost like an annihilationist, like, OK, that's evil and therefore it should stop existing. And that's the way we should deal with it. And this is the way we have to deal with all of sin in our lives. It's like, OK, I, I'm struggling with pornography as a teenager, so I want to like crush that habit. 
Like that's right. evil. That's that's and it's like trying to deal with that so frustrated me and so messed up my experience. I mean, and I'm kind of going into something personal, but like as an adult trying to trying to engage with sex, it's like when your whole frame of it is that it's this horrible thing that you need to crush and stop because it's bad. And it's like that whole philosophy of evil. I don't I don't I'm, I'm wondering if, there, if there's a place for it, because it, it seems like in my experience, most of the things that I've applied that sort of type of thinking to it's it's come back and bite me and bit me in the ass pretty hard. Yeah. And I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, yeah, it, it's the goal should be to defeat evil. The goal, the goal shouldn't be to, to do evil, right? But the means by which you achieve this kind of state where you would have transcended your own evil and the evil and vanquish the evil around you or whatever, the means is the question. How does one get there? And here, this is where it gets really tricky. Um, Jung, uh, Carl Jung would say, well, you must confront your shadow. And you don't confront your shadow by crushing it, pushing it deeper down into the unconscious. Right. You confront your shadow by affirming it, by going within through various techniques, you know, through psychoanalysis with Jung, yeah. some like some process with 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 uh with a, a Jung therapist yeah. or through um active imagination, which is uh uh, a nebulous technique that he did develop. I'd love to know more about what he meant by it, but uh, where you actively engage with your psyche, descend into your own depths and affirm your evil, yeah. live it out. And though, as Freud said, though, it's, it's not even, it's not even just letting the unconscious suppressed thought or pattern of behavior come in and, and take over. It's not even, it's not just affirmation either. It's, it's actually bringing, I think the way he, even the analogy Freud talks about is that the way to deal with it, with a suppression is to invite it into the same room as the conscious thought and allow them to basically to have a conversation. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And so one thing that I think was lacking in Christianity, and I think we're still paying the price of that is a left-hand path. Are you aware of the left-hand path in like Tantra? Not not explicitly it comes but, from, you know. Is this Buddhism and the, the Tantra? Tantra, just like Indian. Okay, okay. You know, tantric tradition, Buddhism, and then and the traditions as well. Tantra is basically a sense of uh, and a kind of ascesis again, a kind of like uh, spiritual path that one might embark on. And there's a left hand path, <clears throat> which would involve instead of reneging, instead of denying yourself the pleasures and treasures of this world, you dive in and it's through that indulgence, that diving into sin, essentially, that you finally vanquish the evil in you. Really risky business, somewhat analogous to, you know, Christ descending into Hades after the resurrection, after the, the crucifixion. Mm -hmm. He goes right. into hell. That's, that's the... And it's the well, final step in the story too, which is interesting. The, the final step. It's, it's like it's the last thing that he does before, well, before the resurrection. Before the resurrection, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's like he, he, the moment where all hope is lost. Or sorry, I'll, I'll let you you tell the story. I'm... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So he descends into hell and then redeems, redeems Hades, or you know, the, the souls lost, lost there, trapped there. But the, I just mentioned that as an example. But uh, the left hand path is something that Christianity, especially since the Reformation, has been really, really, really uh, reluctant to recognize. Like there is, since the, I think the Reformation did really bad things on multiple levels, and not just because Protestantism is bad or something like that. That's not what I mean. I mean that it, it every, the minute you have a fractured church split up into a thousand pieces, each of those pieces wants to show that it's good. None of them has room to embrace their shadow. They all have to show they're better. So the Counter-Reformation in the Catholics was the same thing. The Jesuits were there to prove that Christian, that Catholicism was perfect, you know, and to convince people to, to do that. Now, to their credit, the Jesuits developed techniques for investigating the shadow that are much more sophisticated than you'll find elsewhere, I think, uh, in, in Catholicism. But the point is this. There was uh, religion becomes politicized and therefore becomes ideological and therefore becomes incapable of engaging with the dark half of its own of its own construction the dark half becomes inaccessible it was much more accessible i think 
to people in the Middle Ages. So we lost that. Now, it comes back in the 19th century in the weirdest place. It comes back in Paris and London, Paris first, especially, through the decadence, the decadent writers, right? through people like Charles Baudelaire and uh, J.K. Oisman or, uh, and, um, and uh, Léon Blois. These are, the, these are some of the French writers who start to, these are uh, fervent Catholic writers who write stories about perversion, demons, sin, sex, murder, corruption, disease. These become their themes and they just exult, they luxuriate in, these, in, these, in this. Uh, um, and then in, in England, the same thing happens. Aubrey Beardsley, Oscar Wilde, um, uh, uh, Who's the other big one? Um, uh, Arthur Machen. Um, so these are also British writers who follow that and, and take on that strange path, which is the 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 shameless affirmation and almost kind of celebration and, and of sin in the name of bringing back the good, because all of these artists were appalled by the same thing: the profound immorality and nihilism of their society. And so instead of just saying like Cardinal Newman, like you be good, be Christian, they knew that wouldn't work. And so they dive into the shadows to show, well, if I can't show you heaven exists, I will show you that hell does. And also that uh, one can even luxuriate in hell. So the decadent movement for me was the left-hand path. It was actually David, David Bentley Hart wrote a wonderful essay uh, I read recently, actually. So I've been thinking about this for a long time. Okay. I was happy to find some confirmation there in David Bentley Hart's writing because I have a lot of respect for him um, about Léon Blois, the, the French writer Léon mm. Blois, who he says was kind of like developed a kind of left-hand tantra in Christianity. And of course, the church has completely ignored this. Yeah. Uh, at the same time as, you know, when Oscar Wilde wanted a Catholic funeral, they gave it to him. When Aubrey Beardsley, after all of his debaucheries and all his like horrible artwork, like, I mean, beautiful artwork, I think, but really kind of scandalous art right. decided to convert, they took him in. Um, so there's a kind of tacit, silent embrace of that, that I think is, that's what I called in the class that we did, the night side of, 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 of Catholicism. And you don't really have a good idea of what's going on in Catholicism when you see the ways in which that side can manifest. I think it's a, it's, it's a shadow that's there and it needs to be confronted. It needs to be affirmed very, very carefully because it's- the, I mean, you said with these decadence, how, how, how it, it, I mean, you say it needs to be, it needs to be engaged with very carefully, but that doesn't, I mean, you, you're just talking about these decadence, right? I mean, that, that, that doesn't sound like they were being careful. They were not being careful. They, no. they basically thought that damnation was worth it. Uh, they, they basically chose that. Mm. Um, and I think that some of them knew what they were doing. They knew they were damning themselves. And others got out at the last minute. Like Huisman, for example, who wrote Against the Grain, Arabour, wonderful French decadent novel, kind of the Bible of the decadent movement. He converted, and in he, he converted to Catholicism. Uh, he was already working towards it, but it's a, after he wrote the first, I think the first three books. So the first book is called Against the Grain, and it's a very strange, decadent novel. The second book is actually about Satanism, and it's like full-on satanic. And then he wrote another one, I think, I haven't read. And then he converted, and then he wrote devotional literature after that. <laughs> And and he he actually writes in his um in the in, in the introduction to my edition that I have of uh, of Arabour, he writes at the end of the introduction he says when 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 this book first came out a critic said that they saw only two possible endings to my life uh, he said that this critic said that my life would end either at the muzzle of a gun or at the foot of the cross and he said. Uh, it was, you know, basically then he says, well, I chose the foot of the cross, but you have to bring yourself to that point where it's the choice between that and that, like between the absolute hell of like not even being able to continue to exist, or that's where he had to bring himself. 
So it's like this, it's, it's very similar. I think if you want to be charitable to that path, and I am charitable to that path without for a minute trying to say that it's okay to do horrible things. Like I'm not, none, none of these people to my knowledge actually committed murder or anything like that. So it was very much of a personal kind of psychic journey they took. Mm. Um, it's very similar to the descent into Hades after the, after the, uh, the crucifixion. And also to that moment where Christ and on the cross says, you know, Similar, Abba, why I mean, have you forsaken me? That, like Christ going to Hades is, is literally, it's like him embracing Hades and like going there and sort of being decadent or, or is that, uh, what are you saying that it, how, how is that similar? It's, well, look, no, it's not like, well, in a sense it is. I mean, in a sense it is yeah, that he's being decadent. Yeah. In the sense that I mean, decadence taken again, just as we were qualifying the word evil and trying to give it a kind of more technical theological meaning, we have to do the same with decadence. Decadence means descent, means de degradation, means fragmentation, means putrefaction. If you can't affirm that as part of what you are, um, you know, he had to follow the course of the human soul all the way down into hell. Right. And so he did that. And he certainly... Uh, you know, he, 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 so yes, I think that he does. So, so the, you know, sorry, I, I'll let you. Cut. Well, no, I was gonna say, so like the narrative paradox of, of Christ as a, as a figure, I mean, theologically anyways, is that we, we say in the Christian tradition that he's hundred percent man and a hundred percent God, right? He's, yeah. he completely, as Jonathan Bajot says, fills the hierarchy. He goes to yeah. the very bottom and essentially the very top. So he's, there we go. It's, yeah. it's not that he's, this this and this separated he's not lucifer and aruman he's somehow this full polar engagement between between the, the the highest light and the darkest dark yeah but it's by going into the dark that he vanquishes the dark and is so what what is how, what does that process look like i'm sorry i'm not sure if you were going to go somewhere else but i mean that that this, this is like the the real crux i think of my question of, of just how to how to engage with this stuff i mean do you you have to figure out a way of of loving like and, and i mean maybe it's uh, we want to go and try to dig around in what like what love is for a second but like that that's one of the one of the places that i've kind of stumbled to before in trying to have this conversation with other friends is that that somehow you have to love evil that's my favorite saying isaac the syrian said I think I've mentioned it to you before. It's Maybe in that conversation that we were not releasing. <laughs> um, Isaac the Syrian, one of the Desert Fathers, said, uh, "Great passage." He 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 said, "What is a merciful heart? It is a heart that burns with love for all of for for all the animals, for all people, for the demons, for all creation." I'm mangling it a bit, but that's essentially it. so. A heart that burns with love for the demons, and so. I'm not saying there's a there's there's a there's a shitty way of hearing what I'm saying, and that shitty way of hearing it, or at least I would think, is that I'm excusing immoral behavior, or even always massive tragedy. Left hand, what's that? Or even tragedy that exists. Like a, you want to be able to say that the Holocaust or that like the tsunami that, oh, God. that killed yeah. those, many many people in those islands many many years ago is like you want to be able to look at that stuff and say that is evil. Yes, and but I think I think that that's what Baudelaire was trying to do. I don't think he was trying to say there was something good about evil. He wasn't saying evil is good, which is what someone like Nietzsche sometimes is saying. Okay, so Nietzsche is much more uh, in that vein than Baudelaire or Oscar Wilde. What they were saying was that evil is evil, and evil exists which means that there is a moral axis to the universe. So you can't say evil is evil without saying good is good. So you're affirming the vertical axis that modernity wants to collapse into the horizontal axis of. So like we said, like there's, there's the horizontal axis of causal reality, right? The world as we know it, the below. And then there's a, there's a, a vertical axis. So there's the horizontal axis of our innate freedom, which is always affirmed by Nietzsche, but there's also a vertical axis of commandment, 
Our, our inner freedom is combined always with a weird obligation. Something me- must be done. I have to do something. There is a right thing to do and there's a wrong path to take. And so by taking consciously taking the wrong path, the decadents were actually affirming the moral axis. Uh, and this is not, this is actually an ancient tradition. What they were doing is exactly what the fools of God in the Russian tradition were doing. You know, you had like uh, wandering, I don't know much about that tradition, but I've read a little bit about it. So you had uh, wandering monks or ascetics in Russia who would do crazy things like take their pants off in public or like pee on the public square, or I mean, that's probably something a lot of people were doing back then <laughs> <laughs> or engaging in, in all kinds of immoral. But they're, they're, they're not doing what Diogenes is doing. They're not just trying to prove that this isn't really, really bad. They're trying to no. affirm that this is like, look how disgusting. Well, they're trying to transcend. They're trying to force. I mean, you can interpret it in different ways. You could say, they're trying to force people to confront that part of themselves by exposing them to it. Right. So, um, it's just also existed in Tibet, you know, the, the, what do you call it? Crazy wisdom or the mad llamas in Tibet. Now this tradition has been used to license a lot of bad stuff. A lot of abuse in the, in guru disciple relationships have a lot of abuse has been justified in the name of like crazy wisdom. Oh, the, the guru is just beyond good and evil. He gets to do this and that, and he gets to like sexually assault his disciples and that sort of thing. So that's why I'm saying that there's extreme danger in the left, left hand path. But when I follow the life of someone like Oscar Wilde, and I look at what he said and what he did and where it led. And what he wrote at the end, I can see there a path towards the holy, not a path towards perversion or whatever. There's it, something really beautiful in the shape of a life. When you look at the life is over and you look at its shape and you're like, oh, wow, that's what it was all about. And when I see someone like Oscar Wilde, I see a, a great witness to the moral to to the moral horizon, a great witness to the vertical axis of the moral. Um and uh, it yeah. it feels like there's there's something different going on though between this decadence and potentially what Jesus is doing in in this you know his descent into Hades and then coming up because oh, yeah it, that was just an analogy and a poor analogy yeah. no but but I I I think both the, both of those seem valid but I'm I'm trying to square what's going on because it, on one hand it's like okay there's there's a there's a um kind of a celebration and just a kind of a, reveling in in decadence that kind of affirms this really is evil and that there's something beyond that but then even you said these kind of crazy wisdom or, or these 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 russian guys who are, are going around and just doing things in public to kind of make people kind of confront that part of themselves to maybe so there's an affirmation of this really is wrong versus a diving into what's wrong and integrating it because there's actually some way of making it right and transforming it and are those different well, I think they're part of. I think they're part of the same cycle. I think that what's going on in um, in in decadence. Um, I'm trying to find a very specific example. I'm not coming up with anything because it's hard to talk about big yeah. movements in vague terms. But I think what the idea the idea is that to confront people with the shadow, to confront people with the reality of their own propensity to evil, and also they're not only confronting people with the, the propensity to evil, but pro- confronting people with the pleasure they take in the pain of others. That's another thing. Taking pleasure in the pain of others is often cited as like, remember in Chesterton, he has like, in a world where it's possible for a man to derive exquisite pleasure from skinning a cat alive, uh, you, 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 you need a moral axis because that we can't, there's no way to make that good. But the thing is that we might not all... Sorry, speaking of the cat, I, I, I've been wanting to ask you, but there wasn't an appropriate time to interrupt. We, we've had a little guest join the join the conversation for a while, but I don't know if you could introduce him or her to your right. Me? What? Your cat. <laughs> oh, my God. Can you see him? Yeah. I, I can't see myself. <laughs> As you can see, he's sitting in my office chair, and I have to sit on this crappy foldable. He was kind of waving at me before, but I, I, I could see he wanted to be part of it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this is my... He's my shadow. <laughs> <laughs> and what's his name? He's a killer. Um, this cat, we, we, we let him out. I say when people, you know, people often say you shouldn't let your cat out because... 
It's bad for the birds. I'm like, I don't let my cat out. I let a stray cat in. <laughs> That's what I say. <laughs> so then my my evil my my evil turns into good. See what I mean? Like, you just have to spin it the right way. I let a stray in. That's a good thing to do. I can't let the birds in too. But like, I think what were we saying? Uh, well, no, I, for, uh, that, that's sorry. good though. You're, so you, maybe this cat, the, the cat thing was, was intentional dis yeah. disruption, but yeah. Right. So we may not all skin cats alive, but we all at some point in our lives take pleasure in the pain of others, right? Uh, we take pleasure in the defeat of our rivals often. If we have, you know, if we're, I don't know, you're, uh, you're practicing an art form and someone else who's a little too close for comfort in terms of what they're doing and they fail miserably. So you, you know, you win the medal and the others don't, um, you know, like this, there's a, there's a propensity in us, not just to do evil, to do the wrong, the wrong thing while thinking it's good, but also to do the wrong thing because it's wrong. Uh, and also, also to take pleasure in, in evil. So how do you, you don't vanquish that by pretending you're different. There is a whole path of like imita imitatio Christi, where you imitate Christ. So you live nobly, you, you avoid those things. And I, I fully I think that's a valid noble path. But at the same time, it's that, like I said, you don't want to be too much of the good son, right? You want to allow yourself to be the prodigal son. You want to say that not the forgiveness that's offered won't even won't just be a forgiveness of the sins you commit but a forgiveness even of the pleasure you took in committing them a forgiveness even in let's say that you strategically become the prodigal son okay that's what the left hand path is but mm -hmm. i'll decide to be the prodigal son and that in itself is already kind of sinful right? is that because you're choosing something you know is wrong yeah <laughs> that gets even that gets forgiven is it also, is it sort of like how Dean. within different within different uh, sort of spiritual tradition? I mean, every cultural tradition there there tends to so, sort of, without really planning it, just kind of pops up. There, there usually is going to be some sort of uh, event, some sort of holiday, sometimes multiple, where you just revel in whatever your culture's definition of, yeah. of sin is. So you have like Halloween, or you have a Carnivalia, right? And and so, and that's like that's not. Like I, again, coming from my my own religious background, is like those sorts of things were considered anti-Christian. Like not part. Like like somebody else came up with that. That was not that was not part of us, and we don't we don't take part in that, right? And that's evil. But yet we still. It's funny because it's it's so enticing. We still want to have some sort of celebration. I mean, this is even maybe sort of the nature of celebrate or the nature of partying, anyways. Which I I, I wonder even what the who cares what the etymology of party, but um. It's partying or even the weekend is like w w these things fit into our, our cycles of life anyways, where we just, we, well, okay, well, usually we don't eat unhealthy foods, but today we're going to have birthday cake. Today we're going right. to eat, we're going to eat lots of sugar, even though we know it's bad. We're going to revel in that a little bit and enjoy it. And, but it's, but somehow we have kind of the psychological and spiritual space to forgive that and say, okay, that, but, but like, it's a party, it's a birthday party. We're going to, we're going to eat the sugar, right. but we don't, and I don't, I, I don't know if we can. This is why I'm wondering if there's sort of a limit, but like, I, I don't know how to do that with. So, I, I mean, I, I get so frustrated with capitalism that I'd like, I, I don't want to go. I don't want to shop at Amazon. I'm so frustrated with the Internet that I like, I don't even want to go on social media. I don't want to use it as a means of connecting with people at all. And I'm so frustrated with with pornography and many pornographic types of of media and entertainment that it's it's frustrating for me to like even decide to want to watch a movie or or go on the internet it's like yeah i think we're oh this is great I, I like where you're going um i'm gonna bring back i think i mentioned this in the class towards the end camus distinction between crimes of passion and crimes of logic and okay that the, that's the difference between let's say like indulgence or sin in a small way and evil you know um before that, I want to say the real decadent moment in the story, in the gospel isn't the descent into hell, um, now that I think of it, but the first miracle, the wedding at Cana. That's the, that's mm. the decadence. 
And I've heard that some Protestants like to argue that, in fact, back then, wine was non-alcoholic, so they were <laughs> drinking grape juice. <laughs> no, the fact is, it's quite clear that people had drunk all the wine. And um, and the reason you save the best wine for last, as, 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 they as the story goes, yeah, read, as the story goes, is because... You save the worst wine for last. You give the, the best right. wine first is because people are going to be too drunk to notice. Drunk. Yeah. People are too drunk and they'll like every, you know, they'll, they like any wine you throw at them. So people are, are thoroughly drunk, but they're running out of wine. So his first miracle is to make sure people can get properly shit faced. And he doesn't even want to do it, but it's his mother that convinces him to do it, which is interesting sort of archetypally with the picture of the mother or something like, I don't know. It, it's like the, the, the feminine, this feminine figure of authority, <laughs> the Jewish mother is like, no, son, you're going to do it. <laughs> exactly. But mom. Like, it's a beautiful moment, but it says, well, I don't know if he doesn't want to do it. He says, my time hasn't come. He means it's not time yet, but he does it. And he, there's also other, there are also other moments where there's a kind of reveling in, in the sheer kind of pleasures of this world and in the story. I, I, I think that, yeah, you know, I think that it's it's important to to try to emphasize that side as Chesterton does at the very end of his book when he says the one thing he hid from us that we have to believe was the most important thing, and it was his mirth, his his joy. Yeah, the fact that sometimes he would kind of like realize this was just a crazy ride. Holy shit, this is crazy. Um, and and I think that um, holy shit, that's a nice expression for this conversation. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> the, whole, the hierarchy is fully contained. <laughs> I hope Pajot uses that expression. <laughs> uh, the so yeah, I think that uh, I, I sorry, I kind of lost our train. Of no, but so so Christ is hiding his mirth because there's a there's a, a decadence yeah. that that has to be. Yeah, I was trying to sneak that in, but um, well, the the yeah, I, I mean. Uh, I don't know. The question is, is the final yes and is, is so, so we're living in such a big world that, yes. that we have access to things that seem obviously evil. Oh, right. The crimes of right. passion. Crimes yeah. Of crimes of, okay. Yeah. That's yeah. what I wanted to get to. Sorry. So at the beginning of the rebel, which is Camus makes a distinction between these two types of crime. So he's talking about evil deeds, right? And he talks about crimes of passion and crimes in a sense, crimes of passion, even the most egregious, horrible, horrific crimes of passion are profoundly human, right? Um, we can look at uh, uh, um, Othello, his descent into madness and go, oh my God, how tragic. There's something tragic about crimes of passion. Um, but crimes of logic are divorced, of, are completely without passion. They are technical decisions. They are not seeing a crime, I, I never affirm your personhood more than when I commit a crime of passion against you. A crime of passion can only be committed against a human being, right? Um, so if I, if, I, if I destroy your car because you, I don't know, you, you insulted me in public or you you know, uh, stole my girlfriend or something like that, some classic situation. And I go and I destroy your car. It's because you love that car, you know? And so it's an affront to your personhood. I see you as a person most when I either love you or hate you. That's when your personhood is most recognized mm. by me. And recognizing personhood is recognizing something divine in you, something that's not reducible to just biological machinery something that goes beyond the crime of a crime of logic is precisely the moment where I decide that your personhood doesn't exist either because I've allowed myself to think that because I am a neuroscientist who thinks that you are purely a machine and therefore can be, I can prod your brain with all kinds of wires and make you experience all kinds of horrors in the name of knowledge. Not that neuroscientists do that, but that's just the classic mad scientist route. Sure, sure. Or because I've decided that my tribe owns personhood and you are not a person. You are some kind of uh, demonic entity that masquerades as a person like the Nazis did. So <clears throat> there's a fundamental difference between these two types of crimes for Camus. Crimes of passion, we, 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 we will always have. And in fact, they're a sign that we're still human. 
they're actually you they have to come it's like norm mcdonald was saying they come with the 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 crime of passion comes with the affirmation the positive side of passion they come together the crime of logic is a denial of the entire axis of passion it's a reduction of the human to mere machinery to mere biological twitching and um it treats people like that and i'm afraid that a lot of these structures that we've built over the last several decades are a sense in a sense logical crime organizations <laughs> um mm. essentially what they're doing is is denying commodifying weaponizing uh monetizing our personhood and and sp sp splitting us dividing us it's as Deleuze saw this coming when he wrote about the society of control it says everyone will be divided within themselves the individual will become the individual that's the way he put it divided <laughs> across flows of information across um circuitries of control so you're always at odds with yourself and so your personhood is compromised your interiority is externalized right. you're losing that that core of the a causal freedom slash obligation that makes you human and you're becoming just a cog in a machine and that's the that's the crime of logic there's no decadence that can embrace that that's precisely what the decadence we're fighting against first and foremost when you read the decadence description of the cities or you know they would draw a lot on on poe and blake and other romantics who had seen the dark sat satanic mills of modernity and what it threatened to do with human beings right. the decadence were absolutely against that so they were fully on the side of crime of passion and fully against the crime of logic which they sensed was coming on the horizon in the soul of man under socialism just to finish oscar wilde is very explicit about how he believes that the one thing that we need to fight is our tendency to reduce man to the level of a machine and that's why he affirmed all that he affirmed mm -hmm. right but the and I, i know we need to kind of circle around wrapping up here but i right. i think i want to the thing about that perspective of seeing man as nothing but a machine is that somebody who's locked themselves in that room can sometimes do really, really amazing things. Yeah. The, the, I mean, the, the amount of, of sort of technical excellence at, at work when you look at the way social media is integrating all these algorithms, it's, it's this amazing, crazy superstructure that's, that's, it's done something un unthinkable. I mean, I, I mean, in a certain sense, it's like the Tower of Babel really is quite impressive. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, for sure. I agree. And, 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 and it makes all kinds of things possible. And we have to emphasize that we're having this discussion thanks to it. <laughs> right. Like, <laughs> and so there, there has to be some way of, and I think maybe I can, I can even link it into the, as simple of a story as you just talking about how you approached engaging with TikTok with your daughter, because I, th I think for some reason that's, that's a simple enough story. It's very practical that, that it, it connects something for me, which is that there really still is a grand lie in all these things, in, 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 in pornography and in social media, in capitalism, in, in the construction of the internet and social media they're, they're actually, they are sort of based on a lie and, and you, you can still affirm that, well, because, because part of it, I mean, just aesthetically, is I, I want to be able to, I've noticed myself having this new aesthetic or reaction to the aesthetics of cities where I just get mad and I just get frustrated. And I don't, mm -hmm. like, I mean, some artists can look at a cityscape and, and paint a beautiful picture and see something wonderful in that. Yeah. But I look at, I look at these tall, you know, rectangles and everything about the aesthetics is just these closed off systems of of boxed in ideology and, and it's like there's hard edges and it's just this big thing of concrete there's no room for for movement or sway or or and and it's like i i get i'm so i have such a, a negative reaction to that but then I, but i want to be able to to have i mean some people i think they look at humanity and see that and, and they have just yeah. a, a negative reaction to just looking at humans. I think these are just a bunch of horrible pieces of shit. I, I, I want all humans to die because it, it's, it's so obvious that we're so evil. And I, that's, I, yeah, that, that's, that's obviously, 
that's not viable. It's literally not viable. If, if, you, if, you, if you're thinking about that way, you can't live. You, you just want to die and you want everyone else to die. Yeah. But so you have to... It's very easy to slip into that, that, that trap. But you, you can't treat it as... So, I mean, the, the, other, the other thing you can do is to respond to it is you can do what a lot of sort of extra pious religious cults want to kind of do is, is just sort of run away from it and use this. I mean, even that phrase I brought up earlier, the slippery slope phenomenon is just okay that's the that direction is bad we can see where it leads so therefore we're going to exclude that direction and then build this whole whole new myth of exclusion where we just we don't include that and then we run into a similar inversion of the same problem and so yeah we have to somehow while looking at things and affirming their evil affirming that there is genuinely a lie there still engage and still forgive yeah still love but not not love pretending that the evil isn't there and pretending that there isn't that if we were to sort of totally embrace or totally become overwhelmed by the thing that that, that would be good it's like a, there's it's that you have to look at the sort of the evil giant and see that there's even to the extent that 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 whatever is evil whatever's a lie in there has taken over there is something fundamentally good that allows it to See now I'm tripping my words again. I can't. I get it. No, I, I, I think that there's there's two ways of putting. It. One way of putting it, simple way of putting it, is to see the good in it, right? There's obviously a lot of good that comes from cities. A lot of good comes from the internet, and therefore you emphasize the good parts and you de-emphasize the bad parts. That's not going to help because of the damage these systems are doing to the planet, to our psyches now with uh, within the internet. Uh, that that strategy isn't sufficient. We can't just say see the good side and ignore the bad side. That's not going to work. We need to transform these systems. We can't transform them from running from by running away. We have to somehow be able to affirm them as they are. Um, my, if to bring it back to my daughter and TikTok, and this is an ongoing project and it's not finished, so I'm not sure what I'm doing or if I'm doing it right. And especially, it's mostly my wife, to be honest, who's doing it, um, who's handling it really, who's monitoring them. Yeah. The point is this. It's not so much about it's like let them do TikTok. They can't you can't do TikTok well. TikTok is a problem all the way down. <laughs> but it's the way they communicate with their friends. It's a way that they get to follow the artists they like, etc. So there's a good there. There's a good. We recognize that she we were hoping that she'll be using it for the good, for a good. I, I got to push back, though, because I, I think there's there's literally there's beautiful creations and beautiful things that are impressive and, and, and deeply insightful that would not be possible without TikTok. Definitely. Right. Definitely. So it's, it's not even that. Absolutely. So you said TikTok is a problem all the way down, but yet it still is is this generative thing that creates something that's that's actually that well, wouldn't. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it depends how McClunian you want to be. If the medium is the message, then the content of TikTok is just a distraction from what TikTok is really doing, which is just, it is just its medium. And the good stuff makes it all, the, just like, you know, Oscar Wilde said in the same essay I was mentioning earlier, he's like, the worst possible slave owner is the one who's good to his slaves because he justifies the systems for all for all the others. <laughs> That's what he was saying. Wow. So in a sense, like the good content on TikTok is even worse because it keeps people on TikTok and it brings even people with a good developed aesthetic sense into it. And then just the medium is the message, McLuhan would say. I tend to agree with you. I think content is important. I think it matters. And I think that there is a lot of good that, that has a lot of beautiful things have come into the world thanks to TikTok, thanks to the way that the interface and the platform functions, it makes new expressions of the good and of the beautiful possible. Great. Well, that's one way of looking at it. Another way is to do other things, right? To like, um, I find that I really like Nietzsche's uh, assessment of this sort of thing. When you find yourself hating something, it's mostly because you're resenting it and you feel threatened by it. Um, if you can make yourself, you know, if you can inject a little bit of what Nietzsche called levity into yourself, a little bit of a sense of humor, a little bit of sense of, of perspective and context going, this modernity thing is not going very well, but it's just one phase of humanity. Things will change and we don't know where they could go. We can't, we can see where the trajectory is headed now from this perspective, but we can't foresee the rift that will come and change the situation. 
the unpredictable element that which is a vestige or sorry which is a manifestation of that radical freedom that i was mentioning exists in nature that will change the situation in ways we can't foresee so just to see like this city is really ugly this is really depressing but it's just part of the real it's not it's not going to get the final word mm -hmm. and just doing that at least to elevate yourself so you that you're, you look at these things as equals you know just like saint francis didn't look at the sun as his father and the moon as his mother he looked at his at the, at the sun as his little brother and the moon as his little sister you know sister moon father son mm -hmm. sister moon brother son this you you get to be like francis was still a pagan he could still see the divinity the weird, strange uh, sacredness of nature, but he saw it as an equal, as opposed to, you know, kind of genuflecting before it and submitting himself to it. There's a kind of way of like, of calibrating yourself in the face of these of these really threatening forces, such that they become, they they lose their sense, their, they lose their demonic appearance, right? They become more. They become funny. They become less mm. become temp, uh, temporary. That's interesting. Transitional, and so you can kind of live with them. But the other, the, the real key thing for me is to do like the real, specifically about the internet. And I'm thinking now about Delphine, as I was saying earlier, my daughter Delphine is that, and and Fiona now, who's also she's not on TikTok, but anyways, um, is to do other things to fill the the intervals of your life with really beautiful things that have nothing to do with any of this you know like maybe you want to practice a religious you want to take on a religious practice that brings mm. you to a beautiful location regularly where you can actually experience an aesthetic beauty that transcends you know whatever the latest tiktok aesthetics dictate my 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 daughter's always using the word aesthetic she's like oh that's so aesthetic and what she means by that is like cool on tiktok that's what the word aesthetic means uh, <laughs> this, like a branch of philosophy <laughs> uh, do other things if you don't like the city i find i take long walks in the city and it makes me appreciate concrete it makes me appreciate underpasses and you know really kind of like uh, uh, non places that in the design of a city, nobody gives any thought to these places, like the path passing under the bridge, or a, you know, you're you're going through this just this weird kind of commercial, like industrial street where no one ever walks, and you walk through these spaces, and all of a sudden you find it's filled with weird little corners and little magical, mm. you know, little elementals dancing around, just little moments of enchantment in those places. You try to enchant your world you try to find the enchantment which is always there because you know a, a, a concrete rectangular rectangular building is just it's just the d divine nature molded into an uninteresting shape but it's still nature and it's still kind of divine sometimes you just gotta like look closer at it in order to, to, to see it yeah yeah, yeah. look That's closer fun. and I also laugh I, I like that levity thing too because I, and it actually this is a weird thing weird place to go so it's a good place <laughs> weird a good place to end with my we, weird studies friend is that um, poop is funny <laughs> it is As and, my daughter Fiona it really would really agree with you <laughs> yeah and this is like some of the wisdom of 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 a lot of like I think it's funny because I mean even in the Christian tradition it's like look go if you want to understand the kingdom of heaven listen to a child speak. Right. Yeah. There's there's certain and I mean, I don't want to pretend I know exactly what, what Christ is getting at when he's saying that. But the, part of it seems to be that like kids just have an intuitive sense about s some things that are like deeply wise and insightful. But that just like because because of whatever reason, because maybe they just haven't been formed too much by society or whatever yet. But they just have this these crazy senses of things. So kids, I mean, everybody knows, and you call somebody being childish if they're making poop jokes because poop is funny. But yeah, it's interesting. I, I don't, and this is such a weird thought, but I, I've thought about this with, with one of my friends, Andrew, just thinking about sort of the the nature. Okay, so when when you when you poop, you're getting rid of what your body can't integrate into itself, right? But it's not this, again, it's not this 
evangelical stance of of putting it into a um a device that warps it out of existence and and causes it right. to right, we, we don't annihilate it because that's like i think the literal definition of annihilation is to just remove the being from well, the thing actually the modern toilet is an attempt to kind of like create make that impression right Flush which it and it's gone so so we have we have this the visual experience of that and that that's probably damaging our philosophy of, of how we engage with 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 the extra like the, the remainder right as, as peugeot talks remainder. about right right and so but more classically like if, if you if you're just like if you don't have a toilet you just go and you just go poop outside a camp it's like okay you're you're actually putting it back into the earth it's like this is what what i don't know how to do with it and so you're sort of sacrificing it to the earth gods and saying okay you can do something with this but i can't yeah. Right. Right. And to me, that's one of the ways I, th I think that might be part of how we deal with. So we still have to reserve that there's there's a real place for for final logical evil, as Camus talked defined it. I think that that's good. But then there's there's this lower evil before that of the evil that that I can't deal with. Right. It's right. it's it's sort of subjectively evil. And and what what you do with that is is you laugh it off. You say, okay, well, I, I don't have anything I can do with this. You, th you throw your shit away, right? Or you fart. <laughs> Every child is an accident. Because <laughs> they love playing with their poo. And that's the way you've just reformulated or, or given us a new exegesis of that great line from, is it Isaiah? Show me the stone that the builders have rejected for that is the cornerstone. <laughs> it's it's like, it's 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 the log. It's, it's a steep <laughs> shit. The cornerstone. <laughs> so on that note, <laughs> well, I I like that though. I I I wanted to um, I don't know. One of the things I respect most about my my brother, and that I love having conversations with him more than almost anybody else in my life, is that he is so good at making me laugh. I try. I always get get myself tied up in knots trying to like worry about the state of of where we're going and, and 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 what's what's happening with the world and i appreciate you diving deep into some of these questions with me and and giving i mean the the, the narrative and this the um the religious and philosophical tools and stories and and songs and and symbols that we've touched on are are giving me some real like uh, these this is good they're, they're gonna work their way into me this week I'm, I'm excited to just let this conversation sink in and process it a bit more Great. but i'm um, thank you so much. I've I've had a great time too. It was a really fun conversation. But I'm so glad to end with laughter whenever we can. <laughs> yes, a bit of mirth. Not a word we use very often. Mirth. Yeah, is it? Is that what mirth actually means? Is just happiness? I mean, I, I literally only read that in like old, super old books, and I like it's this yeah. kind of magical term. I, I I kind of aesthetically I see like this like shiny sparkliness when I think about mirth. Yeah. Yeah, I think I, I see it the amusement, especially expressed in laughter. Mirth. It means like giggly joy. Like child a child's joy. A child playing with poop. <laughs> Perfect. Well, I don't really know how to how to end off of such a silly thing, but yeah, thank you so much for for engaging. <laughs> what did we find? <laughs> Great. Well, thanks again, man. I think I'm gonna I'll, I'll wrap it up here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna end the recording here. Sounds great. Well, that was interesting. If you enjoyed this conversation, feel free to share it with a friend. Or even better, take whatever you found interesting here and go and have a real face-to-face -face conversation with somebody that you care about or somebody that you don't understand very well. I think face-to-face -face conversation is one of the most important tools that we have for building and maintaining real relationships and real communities. Many institutions in our lives have an incentive to crowd out these longer, more engaging interactions with short-form junk food content. The point of this project for me is to spend some time pushing back against some of those forces in my life. I want to practice listening to and engaging with people that I don't necessarily understand very well. I also want to spend some time listening to and learning from some people who seem to have a good track record of listening to and engaging with people that they disagree with. If you're interested in working on some of this stuff too, feel free to keep up with this project by subscribing and pressing the little bell thingy that lets YouTube know that you want to keep seeing these videos. I really think that if we can get better at conversation, we might actually change the world. Anyway, thanks again for watching. I'll see you next time.